Okay, it's three o'clock and we have quorum. So, all right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Langley City Mayor Val Vandenbroek, and I'd like to call the March 7th, 2022 regular council meeting to order and begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Kate State Kwantlen, Maspi, and Semian with First Nations. And for any members of the public who are in attendance to watch these proceedings, welcome. And just a reminder to keep your mics and your cameras turned off while you're in attendance. And those that are in attendance today, I have Councillor Paul Albrecht, Councillor Terry James, Councillor Nathan Bahal, Councillor Rudy Stortaboom, and Councillor Rosemary Wallace. And for staff, we have Francis Chung, our free Chief Administrative Officer, Darren Light, our Director of Corporate Services, Carl Johansson, our Director of Development Services, Rick Baumhoff, our Director of Engineering Parks and Environment, Kim Hilton, our Director of Recreation, Culture and Community Services, um, and Kelly Kenny, our Corporate Officer. So thank you for being here with us today. Um, before we consider adoption of the agenda, are there any changes or additions uh, to the agenda. Okay, that the March 7th, 2022 agenda be adopted as circulated. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor James, Councillor Storeboom, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. All right, motion at the minutes. Oh, sorry. Minutes of the regular meeting held on February 14th, uh, 2022, be adopted as circulated. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Bahal, Councillor Storteboom, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Okay, moving on. Next regular council meeting is March 21st, 2022, and the following council meeting after that will be April 4th, 2022. And now we have library happenings with Councillor Wallace. Thank you. I'm here. I'm just waiting for the slides. Wonderful. This year for spring break, Science World is presenting their special How to Science for four special performances. These sessions offered virtually will have kids think like a scientist. Attendees will be introduced to the scientific process observe, predict, test through a series of demos and hands-on activities. Join Science World as they present some of their favorite demonstrations streamed direct to your home. Hey teens, how creative can you get? Watch for the Teen Imagine Contest coming March 14th and May 14th. Next slide. Uh, so tomorrow, International Women's Day is March 8th. These culturally diverse personal stories represent the viewpoints of strong and resilient women. Participants can practice their English in a friendly, informal environment, reread and discuss articles from the West Coast Reader Online. Calling all young writers. Come explore your imagination and develop your creative writing skills. Join us for creative writing activities, story games, and writing challenges. This program is for kids 9 to 12. Come hang out for an afternoon of tasks and traders. Launch into space with your fellow crewmates and help sniff out the imposters. Play among us with teens across the Fraser Valley on Zoom for ages 13 to 18. For this program, participants will need two devices, one to join Zoom call and one to play on with Among Us game downloaded. You can download free, free download on iOS and Android, PC, Mac, Switch alternatives or alts are or, or also available. Want to sign with your little one, but don't know where to begin? Join us for an intro to baby signing. Signing is a great way to develop speech and support communication before children become vocal. With this program, 
you and your baby or, young, or younger toddler can use books and rhymes to learn some simple, useful signs and discover fun ways to practice together at home. What makes your pet awesome? Join us for a virtual show and tell and intro introduce to your, your animal companions. Introduce us to your animal companions. Share a story about your pet or tell us about their favorite tricks and treats. No pets? Bring along your favorite stuffy instead for kids ages six to 12. Calling all families. Join us for a fun game of word scram scrambles. Players will be given a series of scrambled letters to make us as many words as possible in a set amount of time. Challenge your mind, memory, and vocabulary. Compete as a team or as an individual for some wholesome family-friendly fun. That's your library happenings. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Wallace. That's great stuff going on as usual. Councillor Sturdivant. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Wallace, for your report. There's a tremendous lot of activities going on at our local library. Uh, really proud of the work that's going on there. Uh, I was especially taken by when Science World will come and uh, demonstrate science uh, in the library. I remember uh, the Merchants Association had science in the plaza. It was a tremendous event. A lot of uh, uh, children, young people, and adults really enjoyed it. Uh, they, they did play with uh, a lot of interesting gases and fire and all kinds of stuff. So. I'm thinking the library is quite a bit different from what it was when I was uh, a young person. Um, but uh, that all being said, I was wondering if you'd be kind enough to advise that the, the library is open regular hours and if masks are required, you know? I believe at this time it's regular hours and masks are still required. Um, but if somebody would like to confirm, that would be great. Kim gives a thumbs up, so yes. Thank you very much. I'm sure the viewing public will appreciate that as well as your report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Sturdivant. Great. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. So thank you very much, Councillor Wallace. And we'll move on to Mr. Baumhoff with an engineering update. All right. Thank you very much. And all right, so update for engineering parks and environment for March of 2022. And the first slide we have is of a, a final uh, service connection on the 200 street sanitary sewer upgrade. Uh, this is the section that is south of the Nicomechal River. Uh, the remaining work uh, to be done is uh, the final Metro Vancouver connection to their trunk main right adjacent to the Nicomeco River. Uh, we are still working out some of the details and it's uh, taking longer than we had, uh, we had hoped or anticipated. Um, so the next phase is uh, paving and that's scheduled for, sorry, it's just off the edge of my screen here, March 28th. And um, if we can't get the approval of from Metro Vancouver, we plan to complete the majority of paving and leave an approximate distance of 20 meters to allow for that final connection at the Metro Vancouver main. And we'll do a, a patch and it'll be a, a very well done patch, I would say um, at that time, but uh, we wanna get the majority of the road paved because it's in pretty rough condition at this stage. This is the 208th Street project. I apologize for the blurriness of this picture, but um, just wanted to show the actual concrete sidewalk work on the bridge and the multi-use pathway, the, the asphalt pet pavement uh, leading up to it. That's the shot so, uh, going north. And this is a shot of the paving work done on the multi-use pathway, again, looking north. And this is a shot on the west side of the road um, showing the trees being planted and shows the pavement uh, work as well. So it is nearing completion, um, but the schedule, sorry, let me go back. Um, the tree planting is this week, so they'll be going on to the east side as well. And then the west side bridge deck sidewalk widening is scheduled to start in the next week. 
and to be completed within a week or two. And then the road patching and line painting will be completed towards the end of March or early April. The Glover Road project um, has been somewhat stalled throughout through the winter, uh, but the, uh, as you can see here, the fence has been installed in the median uh, between uh, Logan and Fraser, or I, I guess it's 56th Avenue. And uh, the schedule going forward, uh, the, ter the work remaining is the curb and base asphalt between Logan and Fraser Highway, uh, southbound lanes, and that was, will take approximately two weeks. A mill and pave the top lift asphalt um, Fraser Highway to Langley Bypass, that will also be two weeks. Install planters, sod medians Eastley, from Eastley to Langley Bypass, uh, that's another two weeks. And then road markings, Fraser Highway to bypass uh, roughly two weeks, uh, and that will all be night work as well. We're expecting completion by mid to late May. And this is a shot of, uh, as you can well imagine, that we get a number of trip hazards and heaving within the paver stones in our, in our sidewalks. And this is work being done to re, re, uh, re, resurface and let make it level on 207th Street and Douglas. You can see it's quite labor intensive to, uh, to fix these, make these repairs. This is a shot of uh, water meter repair. And we've had a number of breaks related to the cold snap that we had. Um, some of the meters at the curb uh, will, will freeze depending on how deep they are. So it's been repaired. And this is a shot of the baseball fields, uh, seasonal baseball field prep. Uh, we do this every year. And uh, this is a shot of the barber field. And this is a shot of uh, one of the other fields. And I, I believe it's um, JLIT. And they, uh, this is work done by the Langley Baseball Group. Um, they are putting clay on the infield. So what that will do, it'll provide a much harder and better surface for playing, as well as keep the dust down, which we've had a number of complaints from the residents in the area in the summertime. You know, when they're resurfacing and redoing the fields, it, uh, dust starts blowing up. So this will go a long ways to, to help with that. And this just shows a real good partnership that we have with Lang Langley Baseball that they're investing in these fields themselves as well. This is a shot of, the, of a memorial bench um, in Douglas Park and uh, it's being done through the Langley City Parks Foundation. It is for the public's information that if they have a desire to, uh, to have a memorial bench installed to contact the city and it's available on the website, the Langley Parks Foundation, and they can either make a donation for a, a bench or a table or a tree. And I, I believe those are the options. This is a shot showing uh, repairs and refurbishment at Rotary Park. Not sure what's happened with this picture, but um, it's showing the uh, first part, uh, showing the excavation, redoing the edges around the accessibility pathways, and then uh, restoring, putting the uh, bark malt chips back to the edges. This is work, repair work being done at the Arbor uh, at Sendal Gardens. And Street tree grades, probably not something you really think of too much, but as the trees grow uh, quite a bit wider in diameter, uh, the grates have a natural expansion joint and all of those need to be, um, need to be removed at, you know, from time to time as the trees uh, grow within them. This is a shot of the vandalism repairs uh, at Douglas Park Stage. It's some wire theft, uh, People will go to extreme measures to get a little bit of wire. Um, so it, it co it's quite costly in repairs. And so the next shot, it shows also some other vandalism that we've received and, and been a subject to at that Penzer Park. 
you know, we've made significant upgrades there to reduce it, but it, it's just something that is very challenging. We file police reports and um, the police, you know, we, we ask them to make, you know, more rounds in the area. And I believe they, they do from when it's, when it's possible, but their time is stretched as well. And uh, also just as a message to the public, if they witness anything, if they hear anything, to please call police and they will uh, respond if, again, uh, depending on time available. But at least if we all work together, we can try to get to the, uh, to the bottom of uh, and try to stop these people from doing this. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Baumhoff. Uh... Councillor Sturtevant. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Bromhoff, for your report. I always appreciate knowing what's going on around town and um, how uh, we're moving into the spring. And uh, um, the pedestrian area downtown core is um, going to be able to appreciate some of the improvements that uh, are being uh, uh, brought forward. Uh, I've got, a, I've got well, three things. I want to say that I noticed that those. Uh, um, sidewalk rates for the trees had gone missing in my area, and I was going to ask you about that. Now, you mentioned that there's an expansion joint there. Is that a matter of picking up those grates, then retooling them, and then putting them back again, or did somebody take these grates uh, um, that uh, didn't that wasn't supposed to? I would imagine that the someone has taken them that it shouldn't it shouldn't be removed from the site. Otherwise, it becomes a tripping hazard. Yes. So it's, uh, it must have been a, a theft or, yeah, I, I, maybe contact me and let me know where those are. Yeah, those are at uh, Fraser Highway and 201A, but we can talk about that again. And I want to thank you for mentioning the Parks Foundation. I really appreciate that. I think that we need to do more with that. And I think the general public needs to be made aware of the opportunity to donate to infrastructure in the parks, maybe in the loving memory of a, a family member who's passed. Um, and with regard to Panzer, my, my final question is around um, cameras, um, the possibility of having some cameras and uh, having that park watched uh, is something we've kind of talked about before, but we were shy about going there because of the Civil Liberties Association and the rights for privacy. Uh, I'm not sure if you and or anybody on staff can comment on that. Is that still an ongoing conversation? Is that an option that we can uh, use uh, cameras at Panzer Park to try to catch these uh, individuals uh, who are determining these nefarious acts. Yes, uh, thanks. So, and I, I have talked with about that with our parks manager and I think we need to revisit that and, and just determine what reasons we have for not doing it. And, and I believe we did it at City Park around the, um, the sports box and that seemed to have helped. Um, so we, we should, I think, leave, try to do the same thing here. So we'll, we'll definitely be looking into that. Thank you again, Mr. Baumhoff, and thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity to speak. Councillor Bahal, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. We have to have one person do it each meeting. So I guess I get that award today. Um, but through the mayor to Mr. Baumhoff, for the section of uh, Glover Road between Logan and Fraser, the bike lane design there, is that going to be raised up? Or what's the final design there? Because I haven't seen any work on that section. I guess between 56 and um, Fraser Highway. Yes, you know, I, I need to double check that, but I believe it will be raised. Um, but let me check and I'll get back to you on it. Is that part of the work that's occurring in the next couple of weeks? Yes. Uh, great. Thank you, Mr. Baumhoff. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Wallace, go ahead. <laughs> thank you, uh, through the mayor, to um, Mr. Baumhoff. Thank you for your report. Um, engineering parts and environment is uh, very busy <laughs> with, with all that you've shown us tonight, and I'm sure there's more that you could show us. Um, I'm, I was going to mention, uh, thank you for mentioning this at uh, the City Parks Foundation, because it is a wonderful program, and uh, the, the fact that we, you know, the benches and the picnic tables and the trees 
uh, or something available to the public in, in, more, in memorial. Um, I am curious of what tree species will be planted along the 208 Street project. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that right offhand, but I know we have a list of approved species uh, in our in our bylaw, in our subdivision development bylaw. So we would ensure we follow that uh, that standard. But I, I can get back to you and let you know specifically what it is. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from Mr. Baumhoff? Always great work going on. I like to see that 208 getting finished. Um, I know I've had several people comment that uh, they've really enjoyed it walking their kids to school in the morning because they have such wide access and dogs and stuff. So um, thank you for that. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, on to bylaws now. First bylaw up, we have bylaw 3206, zoning mm -hmm. amendment number 188, uh, RZ01-22 and development permit number DP0122. First and second reading of a bylaw to rezone the property located at 208-1645A Avenue from RS1 single family residential zone to the CD84 comprehensive development zone to accommodate a six unit row house development. And I believe Mr. Johansson would like to uh, provide some introductory comments. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, this proposed rezoning and development permit application for a six unit row house uh, was reviewed by the advisory design panel or ADP and the applicant has uh, incorporated the ADP's recommendations into the drawings including adjusting location of the visitor parking space, adding more architectural interest to the north facade, and adding aluminum fencing along the side and rear yards and separating the front yards among other items. This application is based on the new OCP land use at ground oriented, uh, which permits uh, townhouses and row houses along major arterial streets and transit routes to provide a broader and more affordable range of family-oriented housing options near schools. And to be clear, this land use only applies to this property. It does not extend uh, further east, uh, which is to remain uh, single attached residential. The proposed new building is also generously set back from the east property line uh, with the adjacent uh, single attached home by over seven meters. This application also includes double garages and proposes no parking variances. There are no variances with this application. Parking is according to the current zoning bylaw and includes uh, on-site visitor parking space. And the applicant will also be required to improve the street frontage along 45A Avenue to enable on-street parking in front of the subject property. Uh, and that can also accommodate a moving truck if need be. Uh, there's also the, the parking space on site and uh, also to improve the shoulder on 45A to the east to enable additional on-street parking on the city right away. The applicant's also adding a generous amount of trees along the south property line and the 208 street frontage, which will include a new tree strip sidewalk buffered from 208 street and additional line of trees in the front yards of the new proposed units. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johansson. Any questions or comments? Councillor Sturdivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Johansson, for introducing this particular project. Uh, it's a good looking building um, on the uh, south uh, boundary with our uh, neighbor in the township of Langley. It's interesting because uh, each unit is fee simple. So, as such, it is not a strata. Um, that's something that we haven't seen before. And there are provisions being made to ensure that there's a, a reasonable measure of maintenance um, for all owners to uh, keep the property uh, looking good for all of those who are um, owning in that block. Uh, we did receive a bit of correspondence uh, around the project and I was especially taken by a comment uh, suggesting that uh, uh, the traffic pattern around there should be looked at. And I was just wondering if engineering would be kind enough to consider having a look at that to be sure that uh, people weren't um, making U-turns in the area, 
that would uh, compromise their safety. Other than that, I appreciate ADP as uh, approved the project and uh, that the recommendations that were brought forward are being uh, implemented by the developer. We have a good working relationship. Uh, I would suggest then that uh, it should be uh, approved going forward and recommend that uh, my council colleagues uh, approve it as well. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, it's an interesting project. It's got a lot of possibilities. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, public feedback uh, at the third reading process. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what uh, the residents have to say. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? I'll read the motion that the bylaw cited as zoning bylaw 1996, number 2100, amendment number 188, 2022, number 3206, be read a first and second time. Mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Storderboom, Councillor Pahal, any further discussion or comments? Call the vote, all those in favor, any opposed, and that carries. On to bylaw 3194, 2022 to 2026 financial plan, third reading as amendment as of a bylaw to adopt the 2022 to 2026 financial plan. And Mr. Lay, I believe you'd like to speak to the bylaw. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so this bylaw was last in front of council on February 7th. Um, and at that time, council asked it to be deferred until today. Um, in that period of time, um, engineering has determined that we'd like to add one project to the capital improvement plan, and that's a road rehabilitation project. Um, we're proposing to add half a million dollars for road rehabilita rehabilitation um, in the capital plan. And what that would mean is that we would be swapping out schedule B and just adding the, the one project to schedule B in the bylaw. And we can do that between now that we're only at second reading and it will just be have to be um, approved by council at before the final third reading. Okay, um, any comments or questions, Councillor Albrecht? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and I just want to thank members of council for uh, just delaying things uh, for a couple of meetings or a couple of weeks while we had uh, uh, a further conversation, got some additional information and got some clarity on uh, some items. So uh, appreciate council and uh, the dialogue that we had uh, uh, from uh, the February meeting until tonight. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sturdivant. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Albrecht, for your comments. Uh, I appreciate the delay as well. I was hoping that we would have received positive news from the federal government with regard to uh, some kind of uh, financial assistance for the uh, um, the serious um, cost uh, for policing services because of the RCMP uh, union contract and back pay to 2017. Uh, as such, a, a, as everyone knows, that alone is a 4% increase. And considering that we are at a 4.3% overall increase, uh, I think that we've done a really good job of, uh, you know, controlling um, our spending. Uh, it is unfortunate, though, that uh, um, the way that the province requires us to formulate property taxes the significant increase of uh, the value of detached homes will incur heavily on them. Um, we've tried to be as prudent as we can. Uh, however, at 4.35%, we are within the consumer price index and actually within um, the uh, current inflation rate as well, which is pretty amazing. So uh, I will be supporting this, although I have given it some, some great thought um, because as a matter of principle, I would have preferred not to have a lot of these other um, um, minor um, operating expenses included as a show of support for our taxpayers. But uh, I put this all um, um, at the feet of the, the federal government, the RCMP union contract and the provincial comment, government not listening to us by asking us to be able to separate detached values from attached values for the calculation 
of property taxes. So thank you. I've said my piece and I appreciate the opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, I'm gonna read the motion and then we can have further discussion afterwards. Um, so in accordance with the council procedure bylaw, amendments to bylaws may only be considered after second reading and before third reading. So this bylaw cur currently sits at second reading, so we can consider the amendment proposed by staff as follows. That the bylaws cited as the financial plan 2022 to 2026 bylaw 2022 number 3194 be amended as follows. By replacing schedule B with a revised schedule B, which includes $500,000 additional funding for road rehabilitation to be funded from casino proceeds. I need a mover and a seconder on that, please. Councillor Bahal, Councillor Sturdivant, any further discussion on that $500,000 being added? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor and any opposed? Okay, so that carries. Um, now at this time, before we go on um, to the following motion, uh, for the financial plan, we do have an opportunity to change this, and um, I am going to put a new motion forward on the floor. Um, so what I'd like to do is amend the bylaw uh, to the 6.24% prior and remove all service level increments due to the fact that we still are enduring a world pandemic. Um, that puts us exactly at the cost of living and rise of inflation. We've got RCMP contracts to cover this year. And we've also got preliminary stages of World War III going on with gas prices skyrocketing, food skyrocketing. So I want, I'm going to put a motion out if I can get a seconder so we can discuss it further. If not, then we just go on to the 10% increase. So does anybody want to second my motion to discuss going back to a 6.74 tax increase? Councilor Sturdivant has seconded it. Yeah. Did you want to, anything for discussion, Councilor Sturdivant? Uh, I think you've presented your case uh, in an abbreviated form. I think it's worth considering. I think that the current situation um, is uh, excessive. I, I, I don't lay this at the feet of the pandemic. I don't lay this at the feet of a potential third world war. I lay this at the feet of the provincial government and how they force us to calculate our property taxes. They haven't listened to us. We warned them and now we find ourselves in this situation. And I'm also frustrated that the federal government have given us some relief with regard to the RCMP contract. So um, I think that we should send a message to the general public that we would prefer to keep taxes down to the best of our ability. And I wanna commend all departments for doing the best that they possibly could to keep those costs down. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, Madam Mayor, and thank you for putting forward that proposal. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Light, I believe I came to 6.45, is that correct? With the service increments um, removed? I just wanna have that number correct and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I think Madam Mayor that you're asking us to go back to 3.08%. So removing the service level increments, we will bring us back down from- Yeah, so you're getting rid of the service level increments. So that would leave us at 3.08 overall property tax increase. Okay. Is that what you're talking about? Thank you. Sorry. I, yeah, I was reading the wrong number. My, my bad. Thank you for okay. correcting that. Okay. Any other comments? Oh, you gals came up at the same time. Uh, Councillor Wallace, go ahead. Sorry. Um, this is a hard one. Yeah, we're in a pandemic and, uh, and, and everything that's happening in Ukraine and so on and so on. I, I think that we've done a really good job on trying to keep it as low as possible. And I, I, I understand what you're trying to do, um, Mayor, um, but 
the service level increments we've already had to like I just I just feel if we do that we are going to suffer as a city a growing city um and I think it's necessary that we keep them because it'll just add more stress um us moving through what we have to move through and, and everything that we're moving through and I I just wanted to be remind like if um Mr. Light could maybe um just reintroduce what those service levels are again so the public that are watching tonight know what those are Madam Mayor, I can respond to that question. So through Madam Mayor to Councillor Wallace, um, there were 10 items that were added as service level increments. Uh, one, the, I'll just read them in order. Uh, Glover Road planter maintenance. Um, so we're adding planters along Glover Road and in order to add planters, you have to maintain them. Uh, that was $20,000. We have a planner position in our um, a city employee who is um, in a position will be increased to a planner position. That's an increase of $36,120. There was a communication assistant, part-time $30,210. Administrative clerical support, $43,650. Engineering and development services, clerical support, $15,000. An IT specialist, uh, information technology specialist, $105,000. Sidewalk maintenance, $8,000. Uh, EV charging maintenance, um, electric vehicle charging maintenance, $4,000. Traffic line marking, $10,000. And the environmental sustainability coordinator, $127,500. The total of um, that was, sorry. <laughs> a total of 1.27% overall tax increase. And that's how we went from 3.08 plus the 1.27 for the service level increments I just itemized to a total of 4.35%. Great, thank you. Councillor Wallace, did you have a follow up or? No, thank you. Okay, your hand's up. So I'm just checking, thank you. Uh, let's see. Councillor Pahal, you are next, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll just, I won't be supporting uh, your motion, but I'll give you some sort of the reasons why I'm satisfied with uh, our budget as it is right now and that we're looking for third reading not amended. So we have had this challenge throughout the years of deferring maintenance for years and years. And even this year, um, members of the public might not be aware that we're deferring $384,000 of infrastructure levy this year. And this is something that we continue to underfund. And if you look over the next decade, we have um, tens of millions of dollars of infrastructure that we need to replace. So that's something we've deferred. Uh, this is something that's gonna create problems for future residents of Langley City. Um, people who want to call this place home for the next 20 years. And the longer we wait, the more money it's going to cost all of us. So we need to move. Now it's always more cost effective to do things today than it is to put it off tomorrow. And we put stuff off for too long in Langley City. Uh, we're putting in new planters. We're spending a million dollars on that plus. Uh, and we're not going to spend $20,000 a year to water them and keep them up. That's just, you know, throwing away a million dollars. I, I couldn't do that. Uh, planner position, we're, we're getting SkyTrain. Uh, we're, we've seen the, the record numbers of applications we have in our community. Uh, we know that David Eby, the Minister of Housing, is called on municipalities to you know, move faster when it comes to these applications. I certainly don't want to be a municipality uh, that's going to be pointed at for slowing down processing times because we're not investing in our development department. Um, we've talked about communication in our, in our community. Uh, we need to do better. Um, I, I think, you know, the mayor, you were supportive of this. I understand, you know, with the world situation, um, why you're changing that. I, I totally get that. But we need to communicate, you know, when COVID uh, pandemic happened, uh, we saw the gap in communication just because we didn't have the resources to do it. And as our world becomes more unstable, we need to get out there and get that messaging out on 
on our community and, and what's available, what's open, what's closed. That's so critical communication in this day and age. The IT specialist um, with this um, whole war, I mean, what you probably know, Madam Mayor, is that you know Russia has a huge cyber army. And in my field, because I support security at the Staples US, that's one of my jobs for the retail division. Uh, we're getting messages from our department. We're getting messages from, there was an order by President Biden uh, we're getting messages from the Canadian security establishment saying we need to be careful. Uh, we also know that municipalities are prime targets for um, ransomware attacks. And again, you bet Russia is going to be out there attacking more and we've seen it. So we need to make sure that we have the IT specialists we need in our community. And I know um, we've been understaffed for IT as well. Uh, so, you know, there's other small things here like sidewalk maintenance and EV chargers and traffic lane things. Those are pretty small. So We've talked a lot about the environmental coordinator and I'll talk about that if we move on to third reading, but every single item here, I know we've talked about for the last four months and I'm really satisfied that staff and you know, together as council, we've had a really good discussion. And uh, I just know that every single item here is necessary. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, uh, my apologies for being late. Um, I just wanna clarify, does the motion include taking out all the uh, in, in, incremental increases, all the extra staff and everything? Uh, my my motion was just staff. The With staff what? serval increments. So just the step, the service level for the staff, hiring new staff. Okay. Which is six or seven people, I understand. Correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor James. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor Pahal, thank you. You echoed my thoughts exactly. I said it before and I'll say it again. This has been an incredibly tough year and respecting everyone's feelings about this budget cycle, um, I just have to say that staff has worked exceptionally hard. We've asked them for delays. I feel as though we've communicated amongst ourselves um, a lot on this. Nobody is saying that this is an easy tax year. It's awful. And um, it is, I, I just, I feel the same way that Council for Hall does. If we postpone the hiring of our staff to the long term, it's going to impact future councils, staff at the moment. Um, these positions have been considered and thought out and justified. So I won't be supporting your um, amendment to the motion simply because I feel that we owe it to our community and we owe it to our staff to move forward with these positions because they've asked us for them. They've justified that they're needed. And yeah, I just feel like we'll just pay for it down the road if we don't move forward with this. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Albright. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be supporting the amendment. Uh, I think this uh, Councillor Pahal uh, said it very, very succinctly and on point. So I think this is the best thing for our community. I think it's something that is necessary in order to keep us moving forward. Um, it's not something that um, we necessarily enjoy doing as a, as a council. But uh, as other members have said, we've had uh, long, hard conversations about many things in the last few months. And um, this, uh, this quick change of, of uh, perspective is, is somewhat uh, <laughs> 11th hour. And uh, yeah, I think we've gone too far down the road. Uh, we need to uh, continue on providing the, the service that our residents have come to expect and um, uh, support the services that we're going to be putting in place uh, so that we don't fall further behind. Uh, I think we're still going to be falling behind because there's so much more that we need to do, uh, but we need to start somewhere and this, this is where it needs to be. And, and uh, it's unfortunate, like Councillor Sorderboom has said, that the province uh, continues to uh, not hear us about the discrepancy between single family and multifamily taxation, uh, that would uh, change the conversation, I believe, dramatically if that were the case. So um, yeah, uh, that's my place. And I just wanted to uh, express my thoughts. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sturdivant, do you have your hand up again? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I really appreciate you bringing the um, amendment that you proposed forward. I think that the idea of demonstrating our due diligence and being as careful and cautious uh, about this is a possible. Um, it is an extraordinary expense, especially for detached homes that have increased by 38% in value over the last year. But all things said, um, Councillor Pahal makes a very strong argument. And I believe it would be short-sighted of us to deny our staff the resources that they need to move forward to make our city the best that it can be. I say, if you're gonna write a letter, write the province, write the feds, they're the ones who put us in this situation. Langley City is doing the best they can with what they've got. And uh, I wanna commend staff for the work that they do. So I'll be voting with consensus and I will not be supporting uh, the amendment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Lake, can I just ask some questions for clarification, please? Are these positions extra and are staff, is there a staff shortage in any of those departments that we're doing staff increments for? Is IT short on people? This would be a new position. For IT. But we have people working in IT. We have two IT people right now and this would okay. add a, another one to make it three. Okay. Um, and we can pull from resources like um, this probably wouldn't be a question for you. It would be from Mr. Chung in regards to anything environmental or dealing with the uh, sky train or anything. Modi is the one that holds uh, is in charge of sky train currently. Is that not correct? They're the ones doing the project. Um, Madam Mayor, actually, the TI Corp is planning on the sky train project. OK. Um, and we can use, um, so in regards to dealing with climate action or anything like that for the next year, um, we still have the capability of contacting Metro Vancouver and Fraser Basin Council for help, would we not? Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, not necessarily. Uh, we can certainly contact Metro Vancouver and Fraser Basin for advice and feedback. But in terms of what council wants to achieve for the next year, in terms of solid waste and diversion of uh, salt, you know, garbage and promoting composting and starting the process of developing a sustainability framework for the city. That's something that the city needs to do. And uh, given the current staffing capacity within the engineering parks environment department, it will be very challenging for them to take that on. And hence, that's why we need additional staff for us to take that on. Great. So why wasn't that recommended the first time around? And why was it recommended the second? Now you're saying it's recommended when it actually wasn't. It was a position added on by council. I think there were a couple of things, Madam Mayor. The first one was that we staff do recognize the taxation impact to the community with asking for that position. And what we have done since the introduction of the sustainability coordinator position, we have reviewed the job description. And this goes beyond just looking at the solid waste diversion and the composting, we're actually including many of the strategies that council has adopted within the uh, sustainability framework, uh, interim strategic plan, uh, climate action emergency uh, recommendation. Uh, those, those are, you know, key Those strong, have already all been completed, correct? They were completed in terms of the recommendations to proceed with a number of initiatives, but they have yes. not initiated. So okay. we don't actually haven't started yet. Correct, so we haven't started yet. Okay, Mr. Baumhoff, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to mention that the position was in on the list of requested positions right from the beginning. It was, um, re, it was cut, it was one on the cut list because of the, all the things being considered for, for uh, approval. So it was on the list right from the beginning. Okay, that doesn't really clarify what it does. It was there, then it wasn't there, now it's back, is what you're saying. Well, it was, yeah, it was at, it was on the yeah. list of requests, but then because of budget considerations, it was yep. cut back and then it was put back at, at council's request. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, I will call the vote. All those in favor of going back down? 
um, I'm putting my hand up, I think it's me and Councillor Martin, and all those opposed to going back down to under 4%. That would be our rest of Council. Okay. All right, so that we go on to motion and uh, that the bylaw cited as the financial plan 2022 to 2026 bylaw 2022 number 3194 be read a third time as amendment due to the additional $500,000. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Pahal, Councillor Sturdivum, uh, Councillor Sturdivum, did you have a comment? You're on mute. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to amend the um, um, the motion by uh, taking off the uh, the environmental uh, uh, officer uh, one hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars. I believe that it is. I, I I don't think it's as vital as the other components. Um, is there a seconder? Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, Ms. Kenny, go ahead. Um, just, just for clarification, uh, there can be no amendments. Um, it has to be after second reading and before third reading. So we may not want to uh, be considering third reading and an amendment at that time. So we may want to withdraw, um, have the mover and seconder withdraw the motion uh, to give third as amended in order to uh, consider more amendments to the uh, financial plan. Okay, so do you want me to rescind that? Uh, it would be up to the mover and seconder, uh, Councillor Pahal, okay. to agree to withdraw uh, the amendment to uh, give third reading as amended. Are you gentlemen both okay with that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we've discussed this enough, so I'm not move, amending, I'm not taking back uh, my movement. Uh, if we want to defeat it, we can. Councillor Sturdivant, did you want to push or? Um, I'd like to make the amendment. And We've I, already voted on it. It's already gone to third. So. So I'm out of order. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, it's yeah. too bad because I think it's important. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor so, so uh, we can't we can't talk about this at all because there's no amendment. We're just going to stay with how it is, or um, and like Pahala said, we we've talked about it enough. Um, I, I, if we want to talk about eleventh hour, I think that's what we're doing right now. Um, we're past past due with uh, looking after our environment. It's a global crisis. We just got the UN report card on what where Canada stands as far as climate change and so on. And we've have two people that sat on Metro Vancouver and the importance of regional being with everybody else, how important that is. So um, yeah, I'm just, I'm boggled actually. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Wallace. And I will reply to that. Um, I did not come off the climate action. I was removed from it because I was removed from the Metro board by this council. Uh, second and off, I do believe that climate action is important as I sit on different climate caucuses, which is why I asked the question of Metro Vancouver and Fraser Basin Council available to help us until next year, because right now our citizens are suffering and cannot afford $500 extra a year because a lot of families are going to the food bank. So I kind of looked at it as food on the table or having someone have recyclable plates at an event, which we could do easily ourselves. Um, so the way I look at it is, and I asked, I asked this council to put the position over till next year um, so that we could at least give our citizens a break for this year. And that was denied. So I've done everything I can to support this position. But right now where we stand in this world with the world pandemic still going on and families still suffering, I understand the need for climate action. Absolutely, 100%. But I don't think hiring one person is gonna make a difference when we can get other help from other organizations like we've been doing for the next nine months until the next budget comes around, which hopefully we would get that position filled. 
So okay. that's my response to that. Well, I have a response to you and as far as the recycling plates, uh, that's not what uh, climate action is all about. And we, we, we had an, a heat wave, we had floods, so on and so on. It is about losing seniors to that. And this sustainability coordinator touches on a lot more than recycled plates. And it is a position that was needed five years ago. And it is an important I agree, position. 100% it was needed years ago. And, 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 if we, and if we let it go another year, we are already behind and that's what will happen. Thank you for your comments. You've had your chance to respond. Uh, Councillor Pahal, go ahead, please. And can you please, uh, hands down, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I, yeah, now that we're at third meeting, um, like just to sort of refer to Councillor Sordaboom's request, we can vote this down if people want, and then we can start the process of going through the readings again, which is fair. Uh, and I know we've had a, some good conversation about this over several meetings, including today. Um, so that's why I, I did that. Um, but I just also wanted to touch on a few different things. Uh, first of all, one of the things we've seen this year is an increase in inflation and not playing number games with people, but uh, we saw about a 4% um, change last year and it's like 5% right now. So like Councillor Sordaboom said, we're within that um, consumer price index and in inflation. And I know that was a concern uh, that was expressed in the community is that we really try to stay close to inflation. And we are, it is unfortunate that we have this situation of the tax rate reduction for multifamily and then the increase for single family homeowners. And we've advocated to the province, UBCM, um, LMLGA for this. I'll continue to do that as long as I'm on council. Um, I'm sure others will, because that's really the issue we're seeing. Um, I know the mayor did talk about folks that are going to the food bank and that is, that is really unfortunate and I, I would say that how this is working, multifamily homeowners uh, and people who are renting are going to be actually seeing a tax rate reduction this year. And it's the folks who own the single family homes, unfortunately, that are seeing the tax increase. Uh, if you look at sort of the demographics of who owns what and where people live, a lot of renters are either, again, renting in a basement suite or they're in a rental single family home that's slated for redevelopment where it might be the end of life or they're owning and renting in multifamily. And again, we're, we're seeing a tax reduction this year. So I think we should keep that in mind as we're having our conversation. When people look at the tax bill as well, there's whole other components that aren't the city. So, you know, school tax, which we need is 21% of that tax bill. TransLink is 5%. The water and sewer fees are 28% being driven by climate change, so it's going over year after year higher than in the past uh, because we need to plan for more droughted, droughts. Uh, and really the city's portion is 46%. Um, so another thing that we should keep in mind as well is that the city over, since I've been on councils, had the lowest average multifamily residential property tax in the region for multifamily and single family. And I expect with this, change as well will be the lowest or second to the lowest. So we are giving great value to our residents just because we are being prudent with our finances. So those are things to keep in mind. We have some of the lowest property taxes on average for residential properties in the region. And that's something that will definitely be continuing. Uh, another reason why we're doing well and why we have to have these conversations of service level increases is our staff has been very conservative in their budgeting and so we have reserves. So, you know, as mayor, you said, because we've been putting money into reserves for the police bump, we weren't hit this year as bad as we could have been. Uh, because we've had money in reserves, we were able to weather the storm of COVID. Um, so we didn't have to have a massive tax increase. We are able to sort of put things on pause in 2021 budget, or 2020 budget, sorry. So, you know, responding to the needs of our residents there. So it's, it is time, it's an unfortunate position we're in. We do need to approve this budget. The sustainability, environmental sustainability coordinator is a, a critical role for our community. I mean, we can't forget that in the summer of last year, we had heat waves that resulted, I think, in the largest like death of seniors in the history of the province. 
Uh, we had floods in our community where we have to do remapping. And that's something that I'm hoping the sustainability coordinator will be able to do because we were surprised. I heard from staff, they were surprised that this one in 20 year event looked like a one in 100 year event. So we have multiple crises that we have to respond to in our community. We have a uh, opioid crisis we have to respond to. We have an environmental crisis we need to respond to. We have uh, a COVID crisis we need to respond to and inflation. Uh, and geopolitical instability. And we can't simply say, no, we're only gonna do one thing. We don't have that choice. We have to respond to all of it. So that's why I'm supportive of this budget. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Stortaboom again. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And and thank you, Councillor Hall, for your argumentation. I, I believe that uh, you've made some really, really strong points. Um, and I appreciate you giving me direction on how we can uh, bring this back to talk about that uh, environmental planner, which I thought I wasn't allowed to, but apparently we are, but we aren't, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the environmental planner isn't gonna help us change the climate in one year. I'd rather see the money go to a social planner myself. I think we're gonna have waves of homeless people now that the province is releasing them from the hotels. And I can tell you that next year is gonna be a different story because I expect condos and townhouse values to go up and they'll get a little bit closer to the reality of housing in our community. So as such, in the hope of bringing this uh, environmental planner back, I'm gonna vote against the current motion um, moving forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess there's all kinds of arguments why, why we should be doing what we're doing uh, in regards to this budget, but you know, there, there's a new, new poll out from Angus Reid that said it found 53% of Canadians say they can't keep up with the cost of living. And, you know, it's due to, to um, housing, food, gas, energy. I mean, I know my energy bill, I think, has doubled in the last couple of months, not because I'm using more energy. The price has gone up. So, you know, if we... We can control what is being spent in our budget. We can't control the gas. We can't control the price of a quart of milk or a loaf of bread, but we can control this. So, um, you know, and all the, the reasons have been given, they're valid, but I don't think we should be doing it right now. Uh, it's just uh, too hard on people and um, I will be voting against third reading. Thank you. Councillor Albright. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I've been struggling with some technical stuff, so if my cut out, I apologize ahead of time. Um, uh, it's it's an interesting interesting world we live in. Uh, the last week week and a half has been pretty dramatic, and I understand what everybody is saying, and and I do appreciate everyone's. Uh, position. I know a month ago, February 7th, this, this budget came forward. And uh, uh, let me see, it was, I think it was Councillor Pahal and uh, Mayor Val was uh, opposed to deferral uh, of the uh, of the budget uh, conversation, because they wanted the whole package going forward that included the environmental sustainability coordinator. And now a few a few short days, weeks, all of a sudden the whole landscape turns upside down. So um, again, I get it, I understand it. I, I, I wish there was an, a silver bullet. I wish there was a, uh, an easy way of taking care of our community, but I will uh, support the budget. Uh, I believe we need to move forward. We need to support staff. We need to support our community and where we're going in our future. This isn't just you and me, this is our children, our grandchildren and future generations. Uh, this, this is something that we need to do. Um, and, and quite frankly, the environmental coordinator adds up to $10 per year on an average house or 80, 80 cents a month. So I'm not saying it's nothing, but it's not as dramatic as what some people are making it out to be. 
and uh, I guess it's the political silly season. So anyways, that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Balbrock. And what I can say to that to you is, me and Councillor Bahal moved that forward, but you have no idea how we would have voted on that motion. So thank you for your opinion, but you have no idea on how I was gonna vote. So personally, your comments are irrelevant and this political silly season, you can say whatever you want. I have listened to people that have contacted me and I think that's a good thing as the mayor. So if I've gotten 20 emails from somebody, from people across the board saying, lower the taxes, then that's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm here doing today. And that's not political silliness. That's actually listening to citizens that can't afford it. I had one lady tell me she can't afford formula. She's gonna have to decide whether or not to buy formula or fresh vegetables for her other kids. So yeah, my choice. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that done, um, I see we're not gonna be rescinding it. So Councillor Storterboom um, and Councillor Bahal. So we're gonna move on to bylaw 3207, accommodation tax bylaw, final reading of a bylaw to request the- uh, Matt, Sorry, do we have to vote first yes. on third reading? No, because- Yes, Madam Mayor, we're at uh, giving consideration to third reading as amended to the financial plan. We already voted on that before that discussion, no, Kelly. We haven't. We voted on whether to uh, make an amendment uh, on your amendment. Yep. And then we had this discussion. I pulled my amendment up and we voted on that and that was denied. And then I pulled the vote on the, the amended, be it read a third time as amended. Yeah. We and already voted on that. My understanding is we have not voted on that. Okay, can we go back and look at the um, camera then? Um, does council as a whole uh, have any information they can provide? It was me and Gail that opposed it, the rest of people. Um, and then Rudy brought up, Councillor Storterbroom bought, brought up um, putting in his amendment. And then you came on saying we couldn't do that. Is that not correct? That's right. He wanted to do his amendment while we're considering. And that. Councillor Bahal said no. So, but I let council discuss and say what they wanted to say, and nobody wants to change. Am I correct, Councillor Pahal? Have you changed your mind or rescind? Uh, if, if I may, uh, through the mayor to, to Ms. Kenny, this is my understanding of what happened, uh, is we did, if we go back to the beginning, we did vote on the staff amendment of the $5,000, and we voted in favor of that. I don't think anybody was opposed. Then I believe the mayor, we gave reading, like we gave first, and second reading to um, your amendment, Madam Mayor, as part of second reading, like in the second reading process before moving on to third, uh, people didn't want to move forward with that. So you read third reading. Um, I believe Councillor Sordaboom and I second, like Councillor Sordaboom moved it, I seconded it. I didn't want to change that. Um, so I believe I was under the impression we were discussing right now <laughs> third reading, and I don't think we voted on third reading. That's my understanding. I thought we had voted on third reading already. Okay, I'll call the vote. All those in favor of the bylaw cited as a financial plan 2022 to 2026 bylaw 2022 number 3194 be read a third and final time as amendment of mover and a seconder. So we had Councillor Pahal and Councillor Sertaboon. All those in favor? and opposed. So three of us are opposed. Vandenbroek, uh, Sturdeboom, and Martin. Okay, so moving on. Bylaw 3207, Accommodation Tax Bylaw. Final reading of a bylaw to request the imposition of an additional accommodation tax pursuant to the provincial sales tax that the bylaw cited as accommodation tax bylaw 2022 number 3207 be read a final time. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Martin, Councillor Sturdeboom, any discussion? Call the vote, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. 
All right, environmental scan, Langley City's priority needs for vulnerable populations. Uh, we have a presentation from Dina K. Bino from TRE Community Solutions, and I believe Mr. Chung, you are here to present. Thank you. Before I put, uh, pass on to Ms. Uh, Bino, I just have some introductory remark. Uh, like many communities in the region, uh, the city is facing challenges related to housing and social support needs for the vulnerable populations. And many of them are mentally ill or suffer from substance use problems or do diagnosis. These challenges have high in demand for local government involvement in social issues, despite the fact that municipalities generally do not have the mandate or resources to address the issues at hand. As we know, issues related to homelessness are complex and multifaceted. The city cannot manage th this issue alone. We need community-owned solutions to address social and homelessness issues for our residents. To this end, we have retained Ms. Dina K. Benno of Trez Community Solution to prepare environmental scan of critical issues facing the community with respect to population who are experiencing homelessness, who are at risk of homelessness, and who are exiting homelessness. The environmental scan is the beginning of our journey to discuss and support the city's social planning needs and further analysis will need to be done to develop an overall response and potential strategies. I will now pass on to Ms. Benno to present the findings from this report and I will share my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present um, the environmental scan report to Open Council. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a verbal represent presentation of the report titled Langley City's Priority Needs for Vulnerable Populations and to also support further discussion pertaining to the information that is enclosed in the report as well. So the report provides a focus on the housing, health, and community support needs and priorities of vulnerable populations who are experiencing homelessness or who are at risk of homelessness in the Langley area. The preliminary analysis is presented in a manner to guide further discussion about critical issues, challenges, opportunities, and potential response strategies related to these matters. In doing so, uh, related data, policy analysis, observations, and a sampling of perspectives from various individuals and organizations um, are represented within the report. But as mentioned, it is a sampling, so it's the beginning of more conversations to be had. Next slide, please. The point in time count is the rule of measure that uh, Metro Vancouver has provided over time every three years to survey individuals who are experiencing homelessness uh, to better understand the needs um, and challenges that people are experiencing. It is not meant to be a census um, as it's a survey that's conducted within a 24 hour period. Um, it is, there is general understanding that it is an undercount uh, so for planning purposes, usually we do use um, a multiplier of three or four to determine a more actual number. I think it's also important to remember that individuals who identify as Indigenous are overly represented in the homelessness um, count figures across the region. And that um, is, is definitely um, patterns, conditions, and historical influences that also need to be addressed as we move forward through the planning process. Next slide, please. The 2018 Metro Vancouver Youth Homelessness Count um, surveyed 681 youth between the ages of 13 and 18 years old. Um, the survey included 16 youth or 2% of the overall regional homelessness population. It is important to remember that youth and young adult housing and support needs are specific and they should be provided separately from adult services to support the safety and reduce vulnerability and potential negative impacts to youth. 
For example, ensuring that youth and young adults um, are supported with their emergency shelter needs separate from adults, as well as the intake processes. The youth point and time count provided in Metro Vancouver is an example of a specific supplemental count. So there are other examples of counts such as in recovery homes or across waterways. Um, so the youth um, count in the region is not conducted regularly as the overall adult count is done. Next slide, please. Specific to Langley, um, with respect to population trends, community observations, and how to balance impacts, the city bylaw officers report that over 90% of their time is related to dealing with homelessness issues. Other um, considerations to incorporate as when you're looking at population trends and changes is also migration of individuals from other communities and how the concentration of individuals are and services are noted um, and identified across your community. These can also relate to broader community impacts and for more vulnerable subpopulations. Uh, for example, youth and young adults and th the services that are generated for youth and young adults and the proximity to adult services as well, or commonly known gathering places. So these are things to consider and work through um, planning processes for uh, service allocation and support needs. In addition to that, there have been reported trends that there's an increased inflow of older adults and at-risk populations who are struggling with mental health and other stressors um, since COVID. Next slide, please. So local government does not have the mandate for housing, health, income assistance, or justice. However, working within its mandate and in collaboration with senior levels of government, the nonprofit sector, business, and residents, the city does provide a valuable role of leadership to address local issues and impacts through five, four primary functions. One, to inform, informing local conditions, needs, and priorities. Two, to facilitate, bringing key individuals together to address these challenges, diverse issues, and needs. Thirdly, to coordinate. And this is best when you utilize when working with shared data-informed and evidence-based approaches towards policy priorities. And fourth, to advocate, ensuring advocacy to senior government is well-informed and considers both the community impacts and overall uh, benefits. Lastly, when working with all four functions, uh, collectively with key stakeholders, efforts can be coordinated and mobilized on the ground that are accountable, responsive, and adaptive to all of the encompassing changing needs on the ground. Next slide, please. So this report identifies specific key focus areas. So the first area of focus is access to hygiene facilities and looking at exploration with a nonprofit or faith-based community. Uh, so across conversations and looking at the population needs, there is a clear need for access to hygiene facilities, such as showers and bathrooms um, in the community. Currently, individuals are accessing public washrooms, local businesses, and outdoor areas. The challenges are evident that there has been damage and repair costs related to public facilities, that there have been reported business and public health impacts. And overall, this does increase um, costs to city infrastructure. So there, this does lend opportunity to explore a community stewarded initiative with a nonprofit or faith-based organization to pilot a project or a phased approach to provide access that could provide peer monitoring opportunities, access to much needed facilities and could inform longer term initiatives. Next slide, please. So key focus area two looks at shelter needs. And again, this is imperative um, when looking at this key focus area through a community mobilization approach. 
So this city, again, does not have the mandate for extreme shelter. Um, that is a provincial mandate. However, there's a clear need for extreme weather response, shelter coordination, and daytime warming and cooling centers. Currently, um, individuals can access um, on a limited ability the year-round shelter. However, COVID has restricted capacity limits, and there are also limited extreme weather options. The present challenges include, as just mentioned, COVID. Also, there are severe weather patterns that are increasing needs across the community, across diverse populations with respect to both extreme heat and extreme cold and wet conditions. Broader community impacts need to be considered. Um, for example, where, where these services are provided, how people can access them, are there any other impacts that need to be managed, um, mitigated or planned for? And also ensuring that ongoing demand for emergency resources are considered. Looking at this focus area, the opportunity could be to look at the current um, shelter inventory that is available, and then taking a look at post-COVID conditions, how Salvation Army has an intention to return and reactivate its EWR, and then also taking a look at what other capacity levels are needed and other resources that could be potentially utilized to plan for, um, for a well-informed extreme weather response plan. In addition to that, it's suggested to follow up with BC Housing um, regarding um, their plans on supporting individuals as they transition out of the hotel. Next focus area, please. So key focus area three is health contact services with integrated supports for diverse populations. Recently, the BC Coroner's Report reports that 83% of illicit drug toxicity deaths occurred inside um, in the Langley area. 56% of those were in private residences and 28% were found to be in social housing, supported housing, single room occupancy, shelters, and hotels. The remaining 15% are incidences that occurred outside, either in vehicles, cars, sidewalks, streets, or parks. So there is a clear need to address overdose and harm reduction, um, as well as ensuring that it is a part of a more comprehensive health contact service um, approach for diverse populations. The current access points are health-based outreach and agency-led services. However, housed populations are reporting that they have less access um, due to the need to access these services outside of regular um, business hours or trying to ensure that um, services that they can access are discreet or provided in a respectful manner that matches their level of need. Um, in addition to that, challenges are focused around location, um, as this might not be accessible to all populations, or the type of service within the location may not address or be accessible um, or appropriately matched for the diverse needs of the multiple populations who may need access to these services. In addition, a uh, focus around proximity of youth services to adults needs to be considered. Um, and then also reports of limited consistent outreach coordination and communication um, have been observed at some point and can be seen as an opportunity to be enhanced if a hub and spoke model was explored with Fraser Health, similar to the model that was introduced in the White Rock area that provides hospital oversight as well as nonprofit partnerships and the health authority collaboration with other health support services and the city um, that focuses on expanding its services and its reach for diverse populations throughout the community um, that includes um, kind of a multiple array of access points to these services. Next slide, please. So 
focus area four uh, takes a look at housing as a continuum. As mentioned um, previously, there's an increased need of affordable housing across the country. Um, so Langley is not specific to this challenge, uh, but with that, it's really important to address this need um, across all points of the housing continuum as well. So taking a look at what opportunities may be made available uh, to support individuals and families with access in both non-market and market housing options with support such as rental subsidies or looking at scattered site housing models for certain uh, vulnerable subpopulations. So currently there is a limited supply of BC housing funded and managed non-market housing options. There have been temporary lodging that has been established through COVID um, and limited shelter options that should not be considered as housing, but do support um, sheltering while people are either stabilizing or trying to find other housing supports. And then uh, rental subsidies that can be used um, to access uh, market housing options. The challenges um, during COVID that was reported by some of the individuals who I spoke to is that there were uh, decreasing numbers of rental housing units that were attainable on the private market that were being made available to rent. Um, there's in addition, um, due to redevelopment pressures and, and increasing rental prices, um, a limited number of attainable rental housing options in the market, um, as well as the ongoing demand. So looking at the opportunity in this area is to um, bring forward more data informed um, analysis that would support effective advocacy with BC Housing to take a look at what the current levels are of rental subsidies in the community if and what level of rental subsidies would support to reduce some of the pressures on households who are trying to attain housing in the private market continue exploration of um, projects and initiatives and funding that could support um, other forms of affordable and uh, mixed market housing as well uh, in the community. Next focus area, please. So key focus area five looks at a coordinated response with measurable outcomes. And so that's a part of helping to bring data uh, to inform these needs. Uh, conversations, advocacy, and to mobilize um, efforts on the ground. So there's a clear need for all encompassing and comprehensive support um, through a coordinated response that is person-centered and meets the needs of diverse community members through consistent communication. This is a, a consistent thread that was brought up through multiple conversations out in the community as well. So currently, there's a strong history of collaboration across nonprofit partners and service providers and agencies throughout the community. Um, there currently is a BC housing allocation table looking at placement of individuals in BC housing funded supported housing options. Fraser Health um, has a number of outreach based teams. Ministry of Social Development has community integration outreach workers, and RCMP also has um, a mental health focused team um, on the ground. But the challenges are that um, needs continue to increase um, for, for individuals who are struggling with complex um, conditions in the community. There also has been reports of limited integration of service and support plans in implementation across um, uh, agencies and sectors as well, and taking a look at what type of funding um, and the current resource constraints that uh, many agencies face as well. Um, so collectively, there are reported um, outcomes that are fragmented and communication that is not always consistent or followed through. Um, so looking at the opportunity then of City of Langley having information that they require to be actively uh, participating in the regional efforts to develop coordinated access and homeless managed information systems through Service Canada Reaching Home requirements. 
um, for the region, as well as taking a look at how the data and outcomes that are emerging from these um, tables across the community can be brought in in a cohesive manner to support informing community to inform community planning needs, and also to advocate and mobilize um, the key strategies that have been identified in this report. Next slide, please. So lastly, uh, looking at mobilizing a resilient community infrastructure approach. Working um, together through these key strategies, it's not meant to take a look at each strategy in isolation. Actually, it's taking a look at resiliency um, through the lens of balancing impacts with interests. Um, taking this approach balances um, the social, economic, and environmental impacts and considerations. Um, and to take a look at how uh, these can be worked with and balanced um, to either be scaled up incrementally as capacity and resources are made available, um, to take a look at incremental impact in a way that can be managed and supported, and overall can be adapted as local conditions may change, priority community issues arise, or community partnership or funding opportunities are made available. So in summary, homelessness issues are complex and multifaceted. This report just begins to scratch the surface of that. But what it is intended to do is to start the conversations to lay a, a foundational roadmap to help inform community-wide response efforts. This approach also does not rest solely on the shoulders of the municipality, uh, rather it provides a strategic approach um, that ensures the city is at the table um, with its ability to support um, local leadership, but also to mobilize multi-sectoral input, resources, and commitment to a community-wide response. Overall, I want to thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, Council, and staff for allowing me to have this opportunity to have these conversations with everyone across the Langley City, as it's most noted that this is a very caring community. And with this work moving forward, these proposed strategies offer um, a community-informed and mobilized approach to advance solutions while working with your strengths and assets in your community, um, while balancing the needs and impacts in the community to foster overall health and well-being um, for all individuals in, in the Langley community. So um, this marks the beginning of the work, but hopefully it also provides a clear foundation. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Ms. Mina. It was great information. And uh, I know you and staff worked really hard and community members on this. So thank you for that. Um, I will throw it over to Councillor Storderboom. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I sincerely want to uh, thank uh, Dina K. Beno for her report. It is comprehensive yet concise. I think there's a lot of good information here that we can work with. I, I think that you give us that perspective that we've been looking for. And I would like to suggest that it may be available for council to develop a strategy on some of these things moving forward around developing a regional strategy to deal with homelessness and approaching the ministry as I wanted to do three and a half years ago when I began, but it was put off and put off and put off. I think we really need to draw the ministry's attention to the fact that we are a small business community that has more than our share of homelessness and these people are living in abject poverty. It's impacting the quality of life for all of us here. And I'd really like to finally get something done. I just can't abide it to continue the way that it is. It is inhumane. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you again, Ms. Beno. Okay, any other comments or questions? No, that's wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Look forward to... This is probably going to do more work. Well, I'll put the motion for it right now and we'll. Okay, so we've got a motion here. Um, one, that council received the environmental scan, Langley City's priority needs for vulnerable populations report dated January 26, 2022, from Dina K. Benno of Trey Community Solutions for Information. And two, that council direct staff to develop a prioritized work plan to implement the strategies 
As outlined in the environmental scan, Langley City's priority needs for vulnerable populations report. So need a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Wallers, Councillor Albrecht, any further discussion? Councillor Martin, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Is our current staff going to be able to do this? Uh, through Madam Mayor to Councillor Martins, um, we can certainly uh, provide some resources to help support this. But in order for us to start developing strategies to implement, uh, like Ms. Benno said, a comprehensive integrated approach, we would need some consulting services help to help us with that. And we have uh, put forward a budget a, a request of $50,000 in the 2022 capital improvements plan to retain the consultants to help us uh, uh, to move us forward with that. But certainly uh, there are a number of staff who will be able to you know, pitch in and help, but certainly we will need some outside assistance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Wallace. Thank you through the mayor. Um, I was gonna ask the same question as uh, Councillor Martin. So thank you for that Councillor Martin. And uh, I think this is so, so needed. And I just wanna thank Ms. Benno for her presentation and, and, and all of the outreaching that you did and, and the concrete plan moving forward. And just, uh, you know, talking about the social environment, environmental and economic part of it. And, um, you know, and looking at the complex care. I think the complex care is so needed. Um, we, we, need, we need that support um, because we're looking at everyone as an individual with complex needs. So um, yeah, I look forward to um, this moving forward um, and thank you for your foundational roadmap in helping us to do so. Uh, Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I'd just like to comment that I, I feel like for the first time in a while, we have a concrete plan on taking action to make sure that the most vulnerable people in our community will have support. And I, you know, if the budget receives final reading at a future council meeting, I look forward to seeing uh, this work continue through that capital item. And I'm sure it'll result in a, a full-time position in the city because this work isn't gonna go away anytime soon. The other thing that was really interesting to me is how it intersects with the environment. So we looked at you know, climate change and you know, how that in makes colder winters, more extreme weather, uh, heat in the summer. So I can definitely see the environmental coordinator position and the social planner position and working together to make sure that we're really looking at this holistically because we can't look at these things in isolation. And I'm really happy uh, that you've done that. And I think this will feed in nicely with our sustainability charter because this is part of sustainability. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to moving forward with this. Okay, any other comments or questions? We'll call the vote, all those in favor, any opposed? And that carries. I know we've all been waiting for this for a very long time. So, okay, uh, thank you. Okay, next up, updated terms of reference for the Crime Prevention Task Group. And I believe Councillor Paul, did you have, uh, did you want to introduce the motion? It's your, it's your committee task force, whatever you want to call it now. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd be happy to introduce it. So I'll just say uh, that uh, the updated terms of reference for the crime, or sorry, um, that the updated terms of reference for the crime prevention committee be approved. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, uh, any further discussion, any questions for Councillor Pahal or Mr. Salvage? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed, and that carries. Okay, on to extension of pilot program, consumption of liquor in parks and public facilities. And I believe Mr. Chun, we were up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the city approved a pilot program last year to permit liquor consumption in selected parks and public, public facilities that ran from July 1st to September 30th, every Friday and Saturday only. 
from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. The selected sites included McBurney Plaza, selected areas within Douglas Park, and the picnic shelters at City Park. At the same time, the city conducted an online survey during the pilot program to provide the public with the opportunity to comment on the pilot program. Based on the comments, the, program, the pilot program was generally successful and supported by the public, which allowed people to host family events during the COVID time, such as wedding, wedding anniversaries and children's birthday at a safe outdoor gathering place. Some respondents want expanded hours and days to fit all schedules, such as adding Thursday and Sundays or at any nights up to 8 p.m. However, there were still concerns raised by some respondents that stated liquor consumptions should not take place in parks and public spaces due to drunkenness, dangerous behavior, crude language, smoking marijuana, and vaping. With that said, the majority of complaints that we did receive were related to unruly behavior due to were not related to unruly behavior due to drinking, but for smoking, uh, leashes on dogs, loitering, drug dealing, overnight camping, and after hours loud party. Based on all the comments that we have received and taking a balanced approach from our experience last year, pilot program, and the ability to further assess the program now that the gathering restrictions have been lifted in public places, staff is recommending that the city continues with the pilot program for 2022, but expand the program to include every Sunday from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. So the 2022 pilot program will run every Friday and Saturday from 1, 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. and every Sunday from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. from July 1st to September 30th. We will also continue to do an online survey during the if council approved the pilot program for 2022 to gauge further public impact. And if council supports the extension of the pilot program, we will introduce a, a liquor in parks and public consumption bylaw at the upcoming council meeting. And the bylaw will then come into effect on July 1st, 2022, and automatically will appeal on September 30th, 2022, if it continues to be the pilot program. We're also asking council to allocate up to $20,000 from the enterprise fund to cover the cost for bylaw enforcement, security services, collection of garbage, recycling, organic waste, litter pickup, and signages. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. Chung? Seeing none, I'll read out the um, motion that council extend the pilot program for the consumption of liquor in selected parks and facilities for every Friday and Saturday from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. and every Sunday from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. for the period of July 1st, 2022 through September 30th, 2022. Number two, that council approved $20,000 from the Enterprise Fund to cover the additional resources required to support the pilot program for the consumption of liquor in selected parks and facilities. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Martin, Councillor Pahal, any further discussion or questions? Councillor Pahal, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will be supporting this. Um, just a question to the mayor, to Mr. Chung. I know we had portable washrooms last year. I don't know if we really needed them. Are you suggesting that for this or will it be gone? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Pahal. Yeah, as you can see in my report, I may mention that, yes, the, the potty toilets wasn't really used um, at all last year. And actually it was vandalized quite a bit and we had to have extra services to come in and deal with it. So for this year, the pilot program, we're actually not gonna be providing uh, portable toilets at each of the sites. You know, given that we do have uh, washroom facilities at the West Recreation Center, as well as uh, at the Al Anderson Memorial Pool. So people who do need the washroom facilities, they can use them at those two, so two areas. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Wallace. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, through to, I guess, everybody. Um, I'm having a really hard time with this and uh, um, I will not be supporting it. Uh, if, if Douglas Park wasn't a part of it, I, I would probably support it. We have McBurney, McBurney Lane and, the other areas, but there, there is just too many 
vulnerabilities down down in this park in this area and um i just hate to see that trigger for people that are just you know on living on the edge of the addiction um and so on and so on and and, and the children and this community hub down here it's just uh yeah, so my conscience just can't can't um, accept this at this time. Even though we, you know, we did get some good reviews. Um, if maybe Douglas Park wasn't involved in it, uh, I mean, I like the idea of um, City Park, how it's got you know the picnic shelters and then that's that designated area. I know we have designated areas um, in Douglas Park as well, but it's just when the signage goes up and you know this is it's just it's just triggering. So. Um, Unfortunately, I will not be voting for this. Thank you, Councillor Wolfs. Any other comments or suggestions? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor and opposed, Councillor Wallace. Okay. Up next, proposed council policy, tenant relocation plans. And I believe Mr. Johansson, you were up. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, the purpose of this report is to propose a new Council Policy uh, CO81 tenant relocation plans uh, and uh, for Council's consideration of approval. And this policy uh, is intended to guide the relocation and compensation of residential tenants living in purpose built rental buildings that are being proposed for redevelopment. Now, I have a brief presentation I can run through here uh, to outline the context, uh, the policy context, and uh, the, the uh, overview of the requirements in uh, uh, the policy. So I'll just get my slideshow up here. Okay, so can everyone see that? Yes, thanks, Carl. Okay, so I'll stop my video and uh, uh, proceed with the presentation here. So uh, just looking at current context and uh, looking ahead, um, in the o new OCP, uh, there's a policy 1.18 that identifies uh, the development of council policies uh, or council policy to guide tenant relocation plans. And in the OCP itself, there are some high level uh, requirements uh, that are set out, but there's no numbers associated with it. Um, uh, there's no details. So uh, the development of a council policy is, is the intent of that is to flesh out uh, those requirements. Uh, multiple purpose-built rental buildings uh, in the city will likely be proposed for redevelopment in the next five to 20 years. In fact, we have uh, uh, three uh, that staff have been working with, uh, three potential applications uh, proposing to redevelop uh, existing purpose-built rental buildings. And, and we've uh, made those uh, applicants, the developers, aware of this draft uh, policy requirements and uh, the proposed policy. Uh, and uh, one of those uh, pre-applications has actually now made an, uh, an official application uh, today. Uh, the new OCP and uh, the supporting zoning bylaw, uh, the land use plan in OCP includes significant increases to the density that's available on many existing rental housing sites. Uh, so some of those densities could be in the order of eight uh, to nine, 10, uh, nine times more units uh, on those sites, new units uh, relative to what's on those sites today. Uh, so there's a number of factors to consider when there's a, a rental relocation um, or tenant relocation plan brought forward and that's balancing the economic viability and the compensation. And uh, the new OCP, you know, um, preparing for future growth and of course SkyTrain, uh, the amount of new density that's available on site is, 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 is quite a bit more than what's there today. So that's just an important point. Uh, we know that the redevelopment of rental buildings does to displace tenants, but it also helps to renew rental stock uh, over time. Uh, older buildings get redeveloped into newer buildings. We do have a one-to-one -one replacement policy in the OCP, uh, which will help to ensure that that uh, continues into the future. Uh, but we all know that rents are increasing. Overall affordability is eroding and, and supply of, of uh, rental units is tight. 
So it's important to, um, from a staff perspective, to have a council policy, which of course can be amended from time to time by council. That's re required to provide, we feel this is required to provide clear guidance and certainty regarding tenant assistance as rental buildings are redeveloped. And here's just a, a, a screenshot of the, uh, the policy in the OCP. And you can see here the high level requirements and also the mention in the policy preamble uh, about you know, utilizing these requirements along with a council policy regarding tenant relocation. So that's what we're trying to flesh out and, and bring forward today. Want to make sure this policy was guided by a number of policy principles that you know, seek to balance a number of factors here. Uh, want to ensure there's fair and transparent tenant notice, relocation assistance and compensation, that tenants are being rehoused into suitable accommodations. That's really the thrust of this uh, policy. Uh, the Residential Tenancy Act, the, the provincial government updated the uh, Residential Tenancy Act, RTA, a few years ago to uh, increase the number of months that tenants have uh, for notice before uh, they're asked to leave the building. It's four months. And also there's a month of uh, rent compensation that uh, a developer or a landowner has to provide tenants once they provide notice to, uh, to vacate the building. Uh, we also wanna ensure that we're supporting the development that's guided by the OCP, including the renewal of rental stock. And we wanna, we took a really hard look at our municipal neighbors in terms of what policies they have for tenant relocation and, and really looked at cities of similar size and of contexts uh, in terms of, you know, the, you know, someone like Port Moody, for example, similar size city, similar densities, uh, and they have SkyTrain. So it's, it's one we, we looked at amongst, uh, amongst others. Uh, relocation requirements need to balance the economic viability of redevelopment um, uh, that are available through the, those higher on-site densities, but with the, the compensation. Uh, and we also need to ensure that we're reflecting, the policy reflects the current market context of rising rents and eroding affordability. So with that, I'll just run through some of the, the policy, uh, proposed policy comp, uh, components. Um, and with attachment two, you'll see a list of municipalities that uh, we looked at in depth. And uh, all of those include a uh, requirement for uh, early communication to affected tenants. So when an official application comes in, the applicant or developer is asked to uh, provide notice to the tenants and then set up an information website and also have a series of meetings uh, to ensure the tenants are well informed of what the process is, uh, what their rights are under the RTA and what kind of compensation relocation assistance the developer is proposing. And that's something that would be expected to occur before um, the advisory design panel and public hearing and also a check-in after, after that and as it he heads toward uh, the approval of the development permit. Uh, once a development permit is approved, uh, a developer can obtain a conditional de demolition permit, uh, which enables them to provide notice to tenants uh, to uh, start that four month process. And then whatever uh, compensation and relocation um, initiatives that the developer is expected to undertake would be then carried out uh, until uh, there are no more tenants in the building. And then the developer is able to apply for disconnection of the services and demolish the building and redevelop the site. So all, like I said, all the municipalities studied uh, uh, require this. And there's also, as part of that, uh, there's a requirement to have a tenant relocation coordinator or TRC. And that's something that's uh, funded by the developer and it's a person that's available, point person available to tenants via meetings, email, phone, and really to help tenants find a new accommodation and answer their questions and help them uh, with their requirements depending on their uh, areas of need. And um, all municipalities require this uh, to have a tenant relocation coordinator. Burnaby and the city of North Vancouver require it to be a third party. So an independent contractor or a company, uh, it, it could be uh, you know, a rental management company, something along those lines. And the key intent there is to ensure that the tenant relocation coordinator is uh, putting all their attention into helping tenants relocate uh, to suitable accommodations and, and uh, being available uh, for those tenants, because uh, it can be a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a uh, arduous, uh, sometimes confusing, sometimes scary process. So it's important that uh, tenants are able to have uh, that point of contact available to them. 
Uh, most municipalities require the TRC to find at least three options that are renting within 10% of the CMHC average rent. And what we're proposing here is that, you know, looking in the city of Langley, the township, city of Surrey, if the tenant requests another uh, community, uh, we would uh, expect the TRC to help with that as well. And the support here is really identifying relocation options for tenants. And, you know, upon request from tenants, uh, helping to make contact with property managers, arranging viewings and providing references uh, for tenants to uh, new property managers. And, you know, in, there may be cases where there may be families or low, low income individuals that require uh, application to be made to BC Housing for rent supplements and the TRCs can help with providing those resources. Okay, so in terms of minimum compensation, um, all the, the compensation amounts in terms of months of rent uh, in the proposed council policy are minimums. Um, and the applicant can choose to increase compensation as they see fit. Uh, the numbers are there to provide that baseline as minimums. And landlord and tenants are always able to negotiate what's called a mutual agreement to end tenancy. Uh, so that's uh, between the landlord and the tenant in terms of what compensation and relocation uh, is, is happening there. But the expectation from staff is that the compensation reflects um, uh, at least over the minimums identified in the proposed council policy. And there's also a vulnerable tenant compensation uh, section in, in the proposed policy. And uh, a lot of cities do uh, specifically outline uh, those compensation numbers as minimums including Coquitlam, uh, District North Vancouver, Port Moody, and Surrey. So this table here shows uh, part of that municipal scan showing uh, the months of compensation uh, that are um, provided to tenants uh, upon uh, relocate, to help them relocate uh, to new um, accommodations. And you'll see that in most of the examples here that the months uh, increase according to the length of tenancy. It, it's a common occurrence that the longer a tenant is in one building, uh, the bigger the gap between the rent they're paying um, is between, the bigger the gap is between the rent they're paying and what the market rent uh, is uh, in another building. Uh, so what that means is if you're a longer term tenant, the ability to move to a new building uh, can be uh, difficult uh, if there's not additional compensation to help uh, a tenant uh, move into a new building, pay the damage deposit, and you know, have, you know, have that time uh, to afford those rents, and maybe there's uh, an application for rent supplements that they need to make and get, and get a, a approved for. So that's why you'll see a lot of these have uh, the escalating terms here. So in Coquitlam, it's up to 10 months uh, if you're over 20 years tenancy. New Westminster, their policy is, is uh, static across the board, but there in New Westminster, the council has decided to actually rezone uh, existing rental buildings so they can't be redeveloped. Uh, so they essentially uh, into strata buildings. So that essentially freezes those uh, rental buildings as existing rental for the time being. So some communities have a different approach uh, to uh, um, reduce any amount of relocation that's required. You'll see the North Vancouver's have a specific formula where it, it goes up. Port Moody uh, starts at, at two months. That's very similar to um, a recent application here. And then as you build up over time, uh, it gets up to six months uh, once you're over 20 years. And in places like Vancouver, you'll see that for very long-term uh, tenants, the compensation is very high. And that's uh, based on, again, that gap between what someone might be paying, you know, being a 20 year tenant and, you know, what a one bedroom rental unit is going for in Vancouver is about $2,200 a month. So that's where that, you know, much increased uh, compensation comes from. And also the densities that are possible in Vancouver, a lot higher than in, in, in Langley. But uh, I think that, you know, looking ahead, you'll see that, you know, in, in the report and in the comparison, what we're thinking here is coming up with, an, um, uh, compensation for tenants that increase over time uh, based on the length of tenancy, uh, but you know, re really reflects what's happening in similar size communities with a similar context. Uh, again, you know, it's, it's comparable to Port Moody as, as you move up uh, and also with Coquitlam in terms of that 
progression upwards, but it's not as high as Coquitlam or North Vancouver uh, as the rents there are a little bit higher, the densities that are possible a little bit higher. Uh, it's definitely lower than Vancouver. Uh, but so we're trying to come up with a policy that balances that economic viability, but it's, it's also able to provide additional compensation for tenants that have been there for a long time and might be more vulnerable uh, than ones that haven't been there for as long. So moving on to moving assistance, um, here's uh, some numbers here that uh, are consistent with what's found in Coquitlam and Port Moody. We feel this is a, a pretty reasonable approach uh, uh, that the uh, developers to provide tenants in order to help them move. Uh, vulnerable tenants. Now, this is a, a policy that staff really uh, did a lot of research into, and uh, we really wanted to make sure that uh, there was some clear criteria uh, that <clears throat> qualified or, or quantified uh, vulnerable tenants, uh, because we know that we have a, a large uh, renter population here. We have a lot of older buildings. We also have a high seniors population. So there is some concern that there may be um, uh, seniors or persons with disabilities or both that might be uh, staying in some of these buildings for a long time and might require a little bit of extra compensation to help them relocate. Um, so we also want to make sure that it was clear about who qualifies as vulnerable. So we looked at the BC housing uh, criteria for applying for subsidized housing and uh, for, for certain uh, cohorts. And uh, here they require, if, if there's a person with a disability, um, they're required to be either on a disability pension or have related tax status. Uh, BC housing um, cutoff for seniors is 55 plus. And also we want to use um, income uh, qualification. So if you qualify for a rent geared to income unit, uh, which is typically non-market housing or a deep subsidy unit, very similar to what's being proposed or to be put in a new Birch building at the Langley Lions. If you're paying uh, rent geared to income or RGI or less then um, the, the combination of disability pension or tax status and seniors and or seniors uh, would qualify you as a vulnerable tenant. And in terms of the financial compensation, uh, what we're proposing here is that if, if the developer and the TRC are able to relocate a tenant to a non-market housing unit, then we have a specific um, compensation uh, proposal here. So up to 15 years, it's four months. So that brings it up from the two and three months for um, a non-vulnerable tenants or tenants that do not meet this, this criteria. Um, and as you get, again, as your tenancy goes up in time, then the, the number of uh, months of compensation goes up. Now, if a vulnerable tenant is not able to locate, relocate to a non-market housing unit, of course, the rents are going to be higher. Uh, so therefore, that's why the recommendation is for six months rent, regardless of their tenancy length. And the other uh, part of this is the non-monetary uh, assistance we're asking uh, the developer and the tenant relocation coordinator TRC to provide. And that's, of course, identifying, you know, subsidized housing options, accessible units were required, directly communicating with uh, property managers on tenants' behalf, assisting them with arranging and attending viewings. Um, and as some vulnerable tenants may not have access to internet or transportation, um, and this, this would, would help them to get around and look at units in other communities if, if if that's uh, the case, and also assistance with packing. Um, we, uh, we know that sometimes it is difficult for uh, people to move, uh, especially if they are um, you know have some uh, issues with mobility and that sort of thing. So we wanna make sure that's part of the policy and part of the expectation. Of course, um, the TRC can help uh, with accessing social housing and rent supplements. And we've also added a clause in the policy that that if there's you know, a young family or family, lone parent family or something like that, or young um, or um, a low income household couple, uh, they can also uh, ask the TRC to help them with applying for rent supplements. And, and the TRC is really there again to provide those resources. So a lot of people, once they know where the resources are, they'll be able to follow through on that. Uh, but again, with vulnerable tenants, we wanna make sure there's someone there to help them uh, provide a little bit of extra assistance if they need it. And first right of refusal, almost done here, is that uh, 
all these all these policies require the developer to offer uh, uh, an equivalent unit back to uh, a tenant uh, once the building is complete. And uh, some communities, some municipalities, uh, require uh, the um, the rents in those uh, right first right of refusal units to be below market. Uh, so District North Vancouver, Richmond, Surrey uh, require those rental units to be renting at 10% below market and they secure those through a housing agreement. Uh, Port Moody and Vancouver go a little bit farther. They ask the developer to find below market units that are renting at 20% below market. And I believe District North Vancouver and Richmond also require strata units to be discounted at 5% from the purchase price. So with that, uh, thank you once again for being able to give an overview of this proposed policy. And of course, the next steps are council's consideration of the proposed policy. And of course, council may change the requirements in the policy prior to considering uh, approval. And once it's approved, the staff will proceed with uh, implementing it. And again, it's a council policy that can be reviewed as required as conditions change. And, uh, you know, it's something that could be brought back every, you know, two years uh, if required. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johansson. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johansson, this basically applies to multifamily <clears throat> structures that are being demolished. What about rental single family homes? Does this apply to them too? It would be different, obviously, because you know it's it's a different type of housing. But just wondered if it does apply to them. Uh, yes, to the mayor, to Councillor Martin, in, in the policy, uh, in the first paragraph under scope, we, we make it very clear this is really looking at um, uh, multi-unit uh, yeah. existing rental buildings, so single-family homes. Uh, uh, a suites, secondary suites, duplexes, and strata title units that are rented, uh, the policy is not proposed to apply to those. So single family homes are not uh, part of this policy. Uh, what the Provincial Residential Tenancy Act, again, requires that four month notice and that one month uh, rent uh, compensation. And in this case, the, uh, wherever you have a single attached home uh, that's being rented, that's uh, what would it what would apply to those situations. Thank you very much. I mean, I know it wasn't part of this policy. It is for multifamily. I just wondered uh, in regards to, to the single family rental homes. So it's a four month notice and one month's rent when they move for their new place. Yes, through the mayor. Single family homes. Yeah, uh, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, it's either, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, compensation upon uh, uh, when the tenants leave or it's a month of free rent. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Paul, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And through the mayor to Mr. Johansson. Um, so you mentioned sort of vulnerable people and just to put that into perspective, because I know there's, a lot of people in our community that make significantly below the regional um, median, right? We're one of the lowest income communities in Metro Vancouver, I believe. So when you look at, say, someone who's working, and I'm just looking at the housing tables here for clarity, because I'm sure there could be some people concerned with development, and I think this is what this policy is trying to address. So you would qualify, it looks like, if you have an income under 55,000 as a single person or like in a family, it's like $67,000 a year. Let's pretend that's the right number. Uh, it might be different. This is just from what I see on the BC housing site. But if you're below those limits, does that, that means you would qualify for the rent geared to income. Um, so if you qualify for that rent geared to income, that means that you would be part of that vulnerable group, no matter your age. Um, let's not dwell on the numbers, but let's just say you ended up in that category because of the BC housing calculator. Is that true? Uh, yes, uh, through the mayor to Council the Hall. In terms of how we've written the policy, um, we have added a clause um, in on, on page seven, at the bottom of page seven under the vulnerable tenants clause. Mm -hmm. Of course, as I said before, 
uh, the policies, the intent of the policies to, okay, let's let's make sure that the uh, tenants that are most vulnerable, you know, the longer term uh, seniors on fixed income, maybe with uh, persons with disabilities, fixed income, those are the ones that are are, are defined and it's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're you know they're qualifying for deep subsidy or rent geared income. That's sort of the first um, uh, thrust of that uh, section. But at the bottom, we do identify that there may be tenants that do not have disabilities or not seniors, but they qualify for RGI rents or rent supplements. And the expectation is that the tenant relocation coordinator, you know, through the occupancy report, the information that, that they um, ob obtain voluntarily from the tenants, um, that they would provide additional uh, uh, assistance to those tenants to find uh, accommodations and help them to apply for rent supplements. Like for example, BC Housing has a number of rent, rent supplement programs uh, that can help people to, uh, if they can't get into uh, subsidized housing, then they're able to pay their rent in market housing otherwise. So that's, that's definitely something that has been included in the policy. That, that's really good to hear because I know that um, those rent supplements are really important because a lot of people are actually housed in the, you know, market sec, like, you know, what I would rent, but they're getting a subsidy and then the tenant relocation coordinator would help them with that is my understanding. So that's great to hear. And then as far as like, how does this council um, monitor sort of this based on like accountability for the developer that they're following through and then also so that we may adjust this from time to time how do you envision that accountability component of this i guess through the mayor to councillor pahal um, now with with the what's out you know outlined in a tenant relocation plan and and the policy um, you know first of all having the policy is you know it, it is a guide uh, but you know, the expectation of staff is that, you know, it is a policy of council that is to be implemented, you know, through a development application. So we, we would we would expect a developer to come forward with uh, a tenant relocation plan that would be that would be following this num number one. And then and number two, there's, you know, there's always the ability to, um, you know, further negotiate uh, on certain things if there's a unique circumstance. Um, and, you know, like I said, these are, these are minimums and, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it, it really is between the landlord and the tenant uh, in terms of uh, compensation and, and relocation. But we want to make sure that we're doing, we have a, a solid basis to, to guide that. And, you know, especially with um, applications as well that, that involve a, a rezoning or an OCP uh, amendment application, um, you know, we don't expect OCP amendment applications coming in uh, so much anymore with the new OCP, hopefully not. But, you know, with rezonings, of course, um, you know, there's a number of, of uh, uh, elements that council will be con uh, considering as part of their decision. And council, of course, is unfettered in their decision making. Uh, so that's, um, you know, always the right of council uh, to uh, determine if the compensation package is adequate uh, for the situation. But again, with the policy, that provides certainty for not only the tenants involved, but also the development community. Uh, so they know what's being asked of them. And the other element is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the province has, you know, the, the Residential Tenancy Act, which outlines the legal requirement that the developer landowner has to comply with in terms of formal notice and, and compensation. Uh, so that's something that they uh, have to follow. Uh, otherwise, they could be uh, held, um, you know, in, in violation of the act. Uh, and, and that would be followed up through the residential tenancy branch. And there's a number of uh, sort of remedies that are identified in the act and could be brought forward through the branch. Um, you know, a final uh, tenant relocation report is also asked for. Uh, so staff is able to monitor how things are going. And of course, we're looking at how things are going out in the community in terms of uh, rents and vacancies and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and what kind of development uh, we're seeing in the community. Um, you know, the city of Langley has gone through, you know, I would say a sea change in terms of the, the densities and the heights that we're, we're starting to see. And there probably will be another one of those uh, once the SkyTrain gets under construction and operation. So, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be, uh, uh, there needs to be uh, uh, a review of, of the 
policy. I, again, we want to be balancing, uh, you know, fair relocation and compensation with economic uh, viability, of course. And, you know, the other part of it too is we're getting renewal of the rental stock. And there, there's also policies that, you know, councils uh, asked us to look at a below market rental policy, for example, that will also come into play uh, in, in terms of how that's all, all handled over time. Great. I just have two more questions. Um, so the one question is for the tenant relocation coordinator, does it matter if it's a third party or if the developer themselves just has a full-time tenant relocation coordinator? I think the goal is mostly that that's a full-time position and that's all that person's doing. Is that my understanding? Yes, that's uh, through the mayor to Councillor Paul. That's the primary objective is to make sure that that's why we're recommending having a third party. Um, you know, it could even be a rental management company that the developer retains to you know run the bill. Um, you know, it's really about getting that. Uh, you know that that uh, you know the the full attention of that person uh, on uh, relocating and assisting tenants. Um, you know, in the city of North Vancouver policy, it talks about you know not only having uh, the full attention on helping tenants, but also the parity of support. Uh, in this case, um, we're really leaning on making sure that there's uh, someone there that can be ready to respond, uh, provide information, and really help people. Um, you know, I, I think from a, a staff perspective, from my perspective, I think there are going to be uh, a number of vulnerable tenants that are going to need a little, a little extra assistance. And that's really where we want to make sure that, that the TRC is working on that full time. Great. And so my final question is for the vulnerable, I mean, vulnerable tenants, especially, um, would our expectation or would staff's expectation, because this has gone through council, it's gone through, say, you know, final reading, uh, would it be staff's expectation that the vulnerable tenants are relocated before a demolition permit and service disconnect happens? Uh, yes, through the mayor to Councilor Bahal, um, every tenant must be relocated before the service connection uh, application is, is uh, acted on by staff. Uh, until such time that the, you know, the last tenant has been you know, vacated the building, the service connection work does not proceed until we have proof from the, the applicant. And of course, we, we can look at it ourselves to make sure there's no one in the building. And then uh, service disconnection uh, proceeds and then demolition can occur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Albrecht, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and thank you, Carl. I just want to uh, uh, express my appreciation for you and your staff's efforts in putting together this, this uh, pretty comprehensive report and uh, the and um, the uh, the detail in which you've examined uh, adjacent communities. So I, I really appreciate that we're we're putting forward some some uh, pretty significant thought and and um, uh, you know effort into trying to serve our community. So I, I support the implementing of the policy uh, to protect our residents and. Uh, I think these are very, very good first steps uh, that we will continue to monitor and adjust as we move forward. And, and um, you know, to Councillor Pahal's numerous questions there, I, I think that has shown that uh, we're putting a good due consideration and thought into protecting our current residents and helping them as we um, are going to be experiencing these, uh, these growth um, uh, pressures and pressures and and uh, adjustments that uh, all communities uh, will be facing as we move forward in the years to come. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Stortebum. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Johansson, to you and your staff for putting this together. I didn't know we could do this. I thought it was all governed by the Residential Tenancy Act. So. Um, when you work with the development community and specific developers in particular uh, to identify that we should have a policy like this, uh, I really appreciate the work that you've done and what this will result in moving forward. 
I'm happy to work with the recommendations that you've brought forward. I believe they are median compared to what we've been looking at with other municipalities that were doing this all the time, and I didn't know it. But uh, thanks to you, uh, I think that this is a significant step forward that a lot of uh, our tenants um, may be needing in the years to come to help them move forward. I'm especially impressed by the coordinator function. Uh, I think that that's kind of challenging to be working with people uh, who are in that, well, trauma, that it's, it's a personal crisis if you have to move after a long period of time. So um, special consideration for that is greatly appreciated. On the other hand, I do have a couple of questions. The first one being, um, are people, or should I say developers who have made application grandparented from this moving forward, because I'd hate to think that we're gonna change the rules halfway through uh, an application process. Uh, yes, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Storderboom, are you referring to the application that was heard by council in December of last year? Actually, no, I was uh, referring to the most recent applications. I understand the pyramids are up for uh, consideration. Uh, yes, that uh, application, as I said earlier uh, in the presentation, was made today. Um, that was one of the three pre-applications that uh, staff have been uh, communicating with the developers on, and, and we provided a heads up on our proposed uh, policies uh, for this uh, uh, a week ago. And uh, just so that they're aware of what uh, what's being contemplated, and, and again, with uh, you know, the approach uh, trying to balance, uh, you know, economic viability with, uh, you know, relocation uh, requirements that help people find uh, accommodations. Uh, we we're pretty, uh, pretty uh, confident in, in the recommendations uh, coming forward. Now, uh, technically, the, um, uh, the, the, if council approves the policy today, it would come into effect uh, at uh, the time of the approval of the resolution. Uh, any application that's in before that, uh, staff would treat that as uh, a negotiation between uh, staff and the developer, uh, similar to a previous uh, application uh, that uh, was modeled on the OCP policy. But we have the OCP policy that's in effect uh, through the new OCP, uh, and staff have made their recommendations to council uh, through this policy. So we would, from a staff perspective, be negotiating on the requirements of this proposed policy uh, with uh, any application that came in before uh, this policy comes into effect through a council resolution. Okay, uh, so so it's a negotiation, I appreciate that uh, special consideration be given to those who have already begun the process and engaged us in these development applications and trust that uh, we will continue to work with them in the uh, very cooperative manner that we have moving forward because we're kind of partnering in this housing crisis, aren't we? The second thing is, um, I'm just curious to know if your team has uh, investigated what happens if we're dealing with an unscrupulous landlord who isn't interested in benefiting the tenants but simply moving them out uh, by using force. Are there any provisions uh, that you're familiar with that uh, the government of uh, BC might have to protect the tenant from being forced out by a landlord who might just, you know, shut off the heat to the building in the middle of winter and force them to find a new place or let the conditions in the building deteriorate to the point where everybody wants to move out and they don't get that relocation package. Any comments around that? Yes, through the mayor to Councillor Stortaboom. Uh, yes, through the uh, Provincial Residential Tenancy Act, there's, you know, there's, of course, the, the laws that are required for proper notice for a number of different, uh, you know, tenant uh, landlord uh, scenarios. And of course, there's the Residential Tenancy Branch, which has a dispute resolution process, uh, and which tenants can uh, always uh, enter into uh, to if, if there are issues or or um, you know, situations where they're feeling they're being treated unfairly or uh, unscrupulous. Uh, I, can't, I can't say that. <laughs> unscrupulous, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there, there is a process for, uh, 
uh, for tenants to be able to uh, lodge complaints with the residential tenancy branch, and um, which of course is a, uh, a, a, an arm of, of the province and, and there to really uh, uh, in, enforce uh, the Residential Tenancy Act. So there is that, uh, that avenue uh, available for tenants. And, and again, the Residential Tenancy Act was strengthened quite a bit. Uh, I believe it was 2018 when the changes were brought in. So uh, yeah. uh, that's a pretty, uh, pretty common uh, approach to do that. And, and tenants would also be provided with um, a number of resources that they can access uh, if there is uh, you know, in the case of a tenant relocation situation. So. Yeah, well, let's just hope that, uh, you know, uh, the tenants who find themselves in that kind of a situation um, do get the uh, assistance they need from the province that the province is uh, um, committed to. Uh, but fortunately, here in the city of Miami, we've got good working relationships with our development community. And I think it's really important that we maintain those moving forward. So any consideration for uh, that grandparenting concern would be greatly appreciated. And thank you again very much for your report and your presentation. Uh, I'm happy to support the recommendations. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have a few, Mr. Johansson. Um, in regards to what Councillor Stortabin was talking about, um, actually, I think it was Councillor Paul that started off with it, um, variances. So if this was to go through in a developer had an idea or something, could they come in and apply for a variance on this? And I'm totally for a tenant relocation plan. Um, I'm, I'm fully in support of it. I just wanna make sure that we're doing it properly. Uh, yes, uh, through to the mayor. Um, yeah, of course, uh, you know, council policy is uh, council's, you know, desire for you know how to treat a certain situation, which staff then then implements. Um, you know, if if there is a, a circumstance, I guess it goes back to the development application process as well, because typically these are brought forward through uh, a development application process, and sometimes a developer will propose something that's a little different than what's in the policy, say for urban design or or land use or whatever. And of course, we have mechanisms. Uh, to go through that and staff would uh, be commenting on that and providing a recommendation. Um, you know, as I said before, uh, staff would uh, negotiate with uh, a developer on the basis of this policy, for sure, uh, because that I believe that would be the expectation of council, uh, that we would negotiate on, on behalf or, or we, we would seek to implement what the council policy is. Now, if, it, if a developer is wishing to provide uh, a proposal to, you know, deviate from the council policy, we would expect that it would be something that would be over and above the policy and something that would be, um, you know, obviously meeting the intent of the policy and something that council would have to be comfortable with and something that could be considered as part of a rezoning process, for example. Again, you know, with a rezoning process, there's a number of factors that council needs to consider, uh, obviously density, parking, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, there'll be other factors uh, that, uh, that uh, could be considered by council because your decision-making is, is unfettered according to the Local Government Act. So I guess, uh, long story short, uh, you know, staff's position would be that we would seek to implement council's policy. But again, a developer, if they mm -hmm. feel strongly about something, uh, they could propose it and we would have to evaluate it. And if it's something that's brought forward to council, there would have to be you know, a commentary from staff uh, about, is there a reason to deviate from the policy or not? Great, thank you. Um, now we did speak to other municipalities, which is, you know, uh, great that we did. Did we ask them how it is working and not working for them? And if there is any changes we would make? And did we speak to any of the contractors or developers to see what they think about this as well? Yes, uh, through uh, uh, sorry, through to to the mayor. Uh, yes, there. Um, I do have some experience from uh, when I was in the city of Coquitlam, where we started uh, looking at rental relocation uh, processes, um, and uh, you know, in terms of how uh, that was handled through the developer, and uh, they retained uh, a third party to as a tenant relocation. Uh, coordinator, and that worked really well uh, to 
ensure that they were available to uh, the tenants to provide them the timely information and uh, relocation. And that one, um, to, to my understanding, that one went really well. Um, and, you know, it was a combination of, because of the length of time in the process, uh, a lot of those leases lapsed. Uh, and uh, the tenants that were um, still in, in active leases, then the, the coordinator was able to relocate them. Um, here in the city, our process is relatively quick, uh, com comparatively. So sometimes it's, uh, you know, we were thinking it would be important to, to have that coordinator to help with uh, the process. Um, when I was in the city of White Rock, there was another application that uh, was approved by council on the strength of uh, the tenant relocation uh, plan uh, that was brought forward for that one. So that was a, a good example of uh, the tenants there being uh, relocated to the, to the satisfaction of council uh, approving that application. Uh, in the city of Burnaby, of course, we know that uh, we have had uh, good discussions with their staff there or through email and, and also with Coquitlam, um, who, uh, in fact, Coquitlam has a number of uh, existing purpose-built rental buildings in Coquitlam that are being uh, proposed for redevelopment. And uh, in fact, I think they have 3,000 rental units now in the pipeline there. It's incredible, uh, the amount of uh, development. Uh, but that, that's on the strength of having a pretty successful tenant relocation policy. Now, Burnaby is probably... Uh, the municipality that's gone the furthest. Uh, so initially they didn't have any policy. And of course there was, all, you know, unfortunate cir circumstances where a number of people were being um, uh, evicted from their homes uh, and uh, not being able to find places or, or having little notice um, in that regard. Now the Burnaby policy is quite um, comprehensive, I guess I would say, where developers are required to have tenants uh, relocated to different buildings and then their rent topped up by the developer. And once the new building is complete, the developer brings those tenants back into a, into the building or they continue to pay them a top up rent for a certain amount of time. So yeah, we have had a, a, a number of discussions. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, with other communities, we wanted to make sure that what we're bringing forward is, is something that's been um, uh, tested and uh, something that has some uh, uh, some uh, veracity to it and uh, uh, some, you know, I, I think it's important to uh, to know that it is working in, in other communities. It's not just a sort of a theoretical framework. And, and what we've heard to date is that it is working. And, uh, you know, it, it's really important to have that communication with the tenants uh, because, um, like I said before, it can be a process where the unknown is can be very stressful. Um, you know, when is this happening? When is that happening? When can we expect to be, um, you know, get our notices and that sort of thing. So it's important to have that tenant relocation coordinator provide that, that uh, line of communication. And the other question was, we didn't do any consulting with developers, did we, in regards to this and the developers within the city? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. What I would say to that is that as part of the OCP uh, process, uh, the policy uh, was in the draft OCP, I think, since the spring of last year. Uh, so the overall uh, intent of those key policy areas was included, and that was part of that consultation process, including identifying uh, the creation of a council policy. Uh, we didn't actually go into specific uh, uh, consultations with uh, development industry on this particular policy. Uh, and the reason for that, although we did give uh, the applicants that were seeking to, or thinking about redeveloping uh, existing rental properties, uh, a heads up that this policy was coming. Uh, and, um, you know, because we, we want to make sure we're not uh, popping something on a development community that's not, uh, you know, anticipated, uh, or, or a little bit of a surprise. I think, the intent here is that we bring something forward that provides at least uh, a level of uh, certainty for tenants and uh, the development industry uh, in the meantime. And it's something that could be uh, modified over time. We went a little bit conservative with the policy itself. Um, I think from the staff perspective, we are a little concerned that we're gonna get a number of applications for the redevelopment of rental properties and we didn't have a, a policy with numbers in it. Uh, so in that regard, um, probably was a little bit faster of a consultation <laughs> process, uh, really just involving a heads up. 
Uh, but, you know, it is something that can evolve over time. And of course, uh, we have the opportunity today, council has the opportunity today to also modify the policy uh, to, to uh, as they see fit. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just would have liked to see a little bit more consultation with um, possibly the public, those that are going to be affected by this and um, developers. Um, I know UDI did contact me with some concerns and some other developers of um, maybe not enough research was done with the right people. But uh, hearing what you said, if, if changes can be made and staff is willing to listen, then um, I think I'm satisfied with that. So thank you, Mr. Johansson. Um, is there a possibility for public or developer consultation or in the future? Yes, through the mayor, uh, definitely. Yeah, that's something we can uh, definitely do. And, uh, you know, what, what I would say is that through, um, you know, these applications coming forward, of course, there's going to be tenant relocation plans with those as well. And, uh, you know, I think in the, in the interim, it's uh, from a, a staff perspective, having at least a, a basic policy to utilize for those is, is important at this point. Uh, and of course, you know, staff will take council's direction to undertake consultation on this at, at any time. Um, you know, I think that the below market rental policy uh, project will also include elements of uh, uh, consultation as well. Uh, and I think moving forward, you know, a policy, a council policy is, 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 is quite malleable uh, for, for council to uh, adjust as they see fit based on input from tenants and uh, the development community. Great. Thank you. Okay, any other further comments, questions? I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Um, sorry, I have one more uh, comment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it was cool. Thank you. So just sort of as a, from what I was hearing too, like the, this policy is sort of like our community amenity contribution policy. So they are things that help guide us through the rezoning process. So in and of themselves, a CAC policy or a tenant relocation policy doesn't have any sort of legal um, weight. It helps inform our staff and as, ourselves as, cus as council when we make that decision on a rezoning application. So I think that's why there's some malleability there and some negotiations. For example, with the CAC policy, um, a, you know, we could see a proposal like we saw with the Langley um, Lions housing project where they said, hey, we're putting this tangible benefit into our community. Uh, so would you give us some relief of the CAC policy? And that was negotiated through the rezoning. So this is what this is. It helps guide staff and it helps guide us as council. Um, it's the rezoning that is the, the hammer um, with this policy. So I just wanted to put that forward. And I think it's really important that we have this clear policy, which is why I'm supporting it. I don't want us to be in a Burnaby situation because that was not good. I remember seeing tenants like when I was taking the sky train to work every day with signs on their banner, like on their balcony, say, don't come evict us. Like, you know, people were in tears. Like it was a horrible situation. And this policy ensures that we don't have that. Like I would hate to see um, redevelopment along 204 street with all those seniors, all those people who are making that choice between, can I like, you know, take a taxi to, to work or a car for gas or for food. Right, and then get in the situation where they're going to have to get in a higher rent situation. I don't want to see that. Um, you know, we've been talking about affordability all day today, so this is why this is so important. And uh, I think you know it treats people fairly, and it makes sure that we're getting those people who are vulnerable. And let's be honest, on the 204th Street corridor, uh, that's one of our poorest neighborhoods, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Metro Vancouver, full of seniors, full of people on income assistance. So this policy ensures that those people will get housing. Um, we'll work with the tenant relocation coordinator to get into hopefully below market housing. And if not, I have that tenant coordinator work with them to get into to market housing. And I think it ties in nicely with our yet to be done affordable housing policy, which will set minimums for new projects, uh, new rental projects. So hopefully some of those people can stay in our community because I know one of our um, OCP objectives is that people can live in this community for the long term. So I'm glad that we're putting this forward. I think it's a great start. And especially if we're seeing demand for redevelopment 
in some of our poorest neighborhoods. I think it's so critical that we have this today. Uh, make sure we get it passed now. And you know, if we need to make some tweaks in the future, let's do that. Um, so thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I think we're just we're on the exact same page. I just wish there would have been more public and developer consultation before we even came up with this, quite honestly. So I will support it. It's just um, I, I've heard some concerns from the community and I want those addressed. That's all. Thanks. OK, so I need a mover and a seconder on council approved council policy number uh co81 or co-81 tenant relocation plans mover in a seconder pahal and albrecht any further discussion on that seeing none i'll call the vote all those in favor and that carries okay thank you mr johansson all right on to new and unfinished business um, motions, notices of motions. First one up is a letter of support uh, for Ukraine from Mayor Val Vandenberg, which is me. Um, the motion sits, whereas Russia has invaded Ukraine, a sovereign nation with a democratically elected government, and whereas the city of Langley wants to support the people of Ukraine, as well as the residents of Ukraine of Ukrainian origin in Langley and elsewhere. Therefore, be it resolved that a letter of support for Ukraine be forwarded to the Consul General of Ukraine in Vancouver and the provincial and federal governments. I need a seconder, please. Councillor Pahol, any discussion? Councillor Stortabim, go ahead. I see you're messing with your... Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, no, I appreciate the initiative. Uh, I have to say, though, that normally I wouldn't uh, want to engage uh, mandate beyond uh, um, what we have been given by the province for our community and international affairs are, are broad and far reaching. But in this case, um, we've got a, a Russian president who's threatening a nuclear war. Uh, that affects the whole world, including Langley City. So I commend you for bringing this forward. And I would suggest, if I may, that we include this letter be sent to the Russian Consul General in Ottawa, and that uh, all those uh, on council uh, would um, allow for their electronic signatures to be attached to it. I think everybody knows where I stand on this. I sent you a letter this past weekend. I, I'm desperately against invading another country. Um, I think it's ridiculous. Um, and um, that, that even goes for, you know, fishing expeditions uh, to look for uh, weapons of mass destruction. But that's as much as I'm going to say. I support the initiative. I thank you for bringing it forward. And I ask that all of council uh, would um, approve sending it to the Russian Consul General in Ottawa with your signature as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sturdivant. I think that can be added as a friendly amendment. I don't think anybody has any objection to that. So, um, I'll make that motion. Okay, all those in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much for that support. Uh, new business motion to hold a closed meeting that the council meeting immediately following this meeting be closed to the public as subject matter being considered relates to items that comply, which comply with the following closed meeting criteria specified in section 90 of the community charter 1k negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a municipal service that are at their preliminary stages and that in the view of the council could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they were held in public. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Wallace, Councillor Paul, all those in favor, any opposed? And that carries. Uh, motion that the meeting adjourn. I need a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Pahal, Councillor Stortaboom, all those in favor? And that carries. Kelly can turn off the recording.